ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help. My name is David Morgan. I'm Arlington's environmental planner and conservation agent. The September 25th, 2024 public meeting of the Arlington Conservation Commission will be conducted in a remote format consistent with Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, which extended remote participation in public meetings until 31st of March, 2025. This meeting is being recorded and the recording may be made publicly available. All uh, meeting materials can be found at the link that I'm putting in the chat now. There you go. Please note that the Zoom chat feature may be used for questions and comments that contribute to the commission's proceedings and if it's used otherwise, it may be disabled at the commission's discretion well, the chair's discretion, I should clarify. Uh, public comment period will follow the hearing, and the commission encourages attendees to ask questions, offer comments during the public comment period. Chuck Jeremy is our commission chair. He'll facilitate this evening, and uh, each vote taken during the meeting will be conducted via roll call vote. We begin now with roll call attendance. So, to you, Chuck. Sure. Uh, I'm going to uh, uh, review the agenda first and uh, just let everyone know that we'll start out with minutes and go over correspondence. We have an administrator's report tonight from David Morgan. We'll discuss um, glyphosate and um, water bodies working group, tree committee, and the CPA committee. Uh, liaisons will give an update and we will move on to our hearings and uh, just a note that we will be continuing Thorndike. Um, <clears throat> and that will be continued until uh, September 19th. So we won't be speaking about continue uh, Thorndike tonight. Then it's uh, on to a new notice of intent for 49 Spy Pond Lane, and then a request for determination of applicability at um, Colonial Village. And with that, I'm going to go on to attendance and just see if uh, Mike Gildesgame is present. Present. Nathaniel Stevens. Present. Susan Chapnick. Here. Uh, David White. Here. David Kaplan. Here. Brian McBride. I'm here. Uh, associate members, uh, Sarah Alfaro Franco. Here. And Eileen Coleman. Here. Great. All right. With that out of the way, um, we can start with our first agenda item, which is the minutes from 8124. There we go. Um, first thing to note that Mike was in attendance at this meeting. He's noted in the motions and votes below, so I've added him to the roll call in this section. Nathaniel had a few clarifying points about the terminology. Um, I wanted to do this live to note that the phone bank place and was requested to be continued and make that change to the minutes. And now uh, Nathaniel had some clarifying points about the Monotony Rocks Park. Um, Notice seven ten. We heard that under the Wetlands Protection Act and the bylaw, but he's noting that um, it's only isolated vegetated wetland that was mapped in their application. So um, saying that there's no know, that there's no um, Wetlands Protection Act jurisdiction if it is just IBW, um, 
I don't know what you prefer that we do about the minutes. We made that mistake and I put it in the legal notice, heard the um, application under both and then issued under both. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think it's reflective of what we've done, but also technically incorrect. So. Well, maybe that was why the 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 public notice actually didn't have. Oh no, it only had. Um, it just had WPA. Yeah. It just just had WPA and should have just had the bylaw. Okay, so it was reversed. Gotcha. No, good point, David. I guess if it's recording about what you guys did, then that's what you did. Uh, but I guess maybe yeah. So maybe it's just comment for the future. Yeah. Right. And when we that. issue when we issue the order of conditions, it should be just under the bylaw, no, Nathaniel? I mean, how can right. we issue an order of conditions under the WPA if it's not jurisdictional? Right. Yeah, to D, but DEP issued a file number, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we've issued the... Yeah, if it's issued, that's fine. It's, the town's not going to record it anyways, I'm sure, so it's not okay. big... Nathaniel, okay. I missed some of this because I uh, I uh, lost connection. But um, so we we you know our decision as a commission was that it's not jurisdictional under the WPA. I guess that's what I'm hearing. But we reviewed it under the WPA. That was not the decision of the commission. No, I'm just oh, okay. I, I did like I missed half the conversation, so I didn't okay. know if we were just talking about what the legal ad should have said. Yeah. Yeah. I think what Nathaniel's saying is that we should have just reviewed it under the bylaw, but we reviewed it under both. And since the minutes are right. reflecting what we actually did, yeah, they didn't yeah. stand, right. but he's clarifying that. For yeah, I guess that's what I missed. What, why would we just review it under the bylaw? Because he's they just want to get the crux of this. Sure. Well, I think if you know there's I just isolated vegetated wetland, there's no there's no wetlands protection act jurisdiction. So you're right. I mean, I guess you would have reviewed it. Under, under both, and then yeah. you would have concluded that there's no jurisdiction under the uh, Wetlands Protection Act, and but you would have concluded jurisdiction under the bylaw and then permitted it only under the bylaw. Okay. So maybe you'd issue your <clears throat> form of a finding of no significance or something, but no, I think I think you just issue a, a, you just have a statement in the finding that there's no jurisdiction under the act. <clears throat> okay, I, I, that I understand, yeah, okay. Under both, when it comes in, but we our determination was it was only uh, applicable under our bylaw. All right. Uh, the next point here is uh, Nathaniel's note about the new preliminary FEMA maps. These were uh, th these minutes were from the first of August meeting, and I've since learned that FEMA intends to have these out this fall and um nothing was saying here too that the uh, DEP circuit rider for our region has said you know start using these so we the town has taken the steps of using the new data in our GIS and will be henceforth uh referring to those maps for a floodplain district and that aligns with conservation commission's jurisdiction when it comes to floodplain. So um, we've taken steps to make the data available in order to do the analysis that we need to do about whether or not something is jurisdictional to the floodplain using the new maps. Um, just an additional point of information on that, but. Um, If we can move on in terms of the the minutes. And we are missing a vote about reopening the hearing for Medford Bow Club. I remember we had some confusion because there was no applicant present for that meeting. And so we decided to close and then reopen the hearing later in the evening. I don't recall there being a vote. I um, don't know if that's a process point that we need to address. 
Um, I did these minutes, David, and I did not listen to the recording. So I, I don't know. We could ask Nathaniel, is this something important that we should listen to the recording and see if we voted? Or no, we, I, we made I don't the motion think so. to continue and it's kind of administrative. We should just let it go. Yeah, I, I think it's it's fine. It's right. not a yeah. I, I I was just curious as to what happened. Yeah. So, so I didn't have any notes that we did a vote, so I thought we missed it, but I didn't listen to the recording. Okay. Yeah, that, that was my moment to um drop by same minutes. Um so that is but we did vote to continue, which is the important vote, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So that's all I got for August first minutes. I make a motion to approve the minutes as edited. Second. Where's Chuck? Did we lose him? Okay. Sorry, I was I was okay. muted. Sorry. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Mike Gilders game. Yes. David White. Yes. David Kaplan. Yes. Brian McBride. Yes. Nathaniel Stevens. Yes. And Susan Chapnick. Yes. All right, great. Um, <clears throat> correspondence uh, received is available on the uh, for the public, and for a full list, contact our conservation agent at the link he's provided in the chat. And that is all the correspondence for each one of these uh, agenda items and the Thorndike uh, for the Thorndike place. We have a Thorndike place page. Uh, moving on, we're going to have an administrator's report from David Morgan, and it will update us on the conservation administrator staffing and public use of Meadowbrook Park. And I, possibly one other thing, which I've forgotten about. Uh, scheduling. So why don't we start there? Um, the October 5th meeting, is that correct? Is the second night of Rosh Hashanah? Third, October 3rd. Um, so it would be the first meeting in October, yeah. And, and I'm just like October 3rd, yeah. Um, so I think we may not have a quorum. And also, I consulted with our DEI division, and uh, they are working on a schedule of sort of high holidays to avoid and not sure to go for Shana's among them, so we're thinking it would be a good time to practice to reschedule any meetings anyway. So um, that's what I offer in terms of a town perspective, and then leave it to you to consider, do we move it to a different day? Do we simply cancel the meeting? Mm. I would suggest, should we, I guess I see two options, either move it to the 10th and then have a meeting on the 10th and 17th, or maybe ship both meetings in October to the to the second and fourth uh, Thursday. So it'd be 10th and 24th instead of third and 17th, since there's five, five Thursdays in October anyways, 31st being Halloween being the fifth. Hmm. Yeah, I would also support moving it off the holiday. So 10 and, and 24, is that what you're suggesting? That's one possibility, yeah. That's good to me. Sounds reasonable. I'm That's fine with that. I will, I will say that the 24th is another Jewish holiday, but it's not a high holiday. And, and I, I will be present. I will, it's Simcha Torah, but and some people observe and some people don't. I I'm fine with having a meeting on that night. It's Rosh Hashanah is a very high holy day. That's a difference, different level. So yeah. and and yeah. By the, time the uh, holiday begins, I think it's on uh, it's on the twenty fourth, but it's in the evening, so the holiday is probably over by then anyway. Uh, before we vote, uh, David, is what's your expectation for those meetings and what's your application uh, level at? Because I guess the second option would just be to move one uh, and there's a third option just to cancel. 
I don't foresee us being flush with new applications. The, I mean, this meeting, let me put it this way. I haven't received any new applications in between the time of our last meeting and this one that would be scheduled for um, a later so date. If we moved it to the 12th, it would be a Thorndike place meeting one basically one agenda item so far yeah and you're talking about the 10th right yeah. the 10th yeah. not the 12th 10th is a thursday the 10th yeah okay. there is still time for new applications to come in between now and then but uh, it has not been busy it might be interesting to just hold that um i'm kind of excited about <clears throat> Thorndike place because we have a lot to catch up on when they come back just to be at one meeting. I don't know what other commissioners think. Uh, yeah. Do we have some time to hold off on this vote? Well, Chuck, we have to tell the public if there's going to be a meeting on the third or not. So maybe at, we could just have a vote that there's no meeting on the third. So we can take that off the website. Yeah, yeah. Month, that's a month away. We haven't changed the other ones yet. Yeah, but yeah you can good. take, we can take the third off okay. and we can make a vote on the 19th on whether we're going to show up on the 10th or what was the 17th, other 17th yeah, or 24th or whatever we're going to do. Because we have a standing meeting on the 17th. That's on the yeah. website also. Right. But we could switch it. I think that makes perfect sense to just cancel the third and then make a decision at the next meeting pending what's coming in. Yeah. To, to meet on the 10th. So hold, so essentially yeah. hold, hold the 10th on our calendars as a potential meeting date. Potential yeah. meeting date, right. Okay. I Yeah. A month, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, we know what to block off on our calendars. That's helpful, at least for me. Okay. So the 10th, 17th, or the 24th, one of, one of those is going to hold two meetings. Well, two of those are going to hold our meetings. Um, yeah, it seems like there are some options. So let's just, uh, does that need a vote to cancel our October 3rd meeting? If it does, can someone please make it? I'll make a motion to cancel our October 3rd meeting. Second. Second. Oops. Mike Gildas game got that one. Susan yeah. Chapnick. Yes. David White. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, David Kaplan. Yes. Brian McBride. Yes. Mike Gildas game. Yes. And Nathaniel Neil Stevens. Yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. Okay, moving on to your next two agenda discussion um, items, uh, David. They have two related scheduling concerns. So checking for quorum on uh, phone back place on the 19th. Uh, Dave Kaplan will be late to that meeting, but, and well, maybe absent depending on numbers. So we've got uh, four eligible vote members for that hearing if, in order to open it. And if there's a decision made on that date, we need all four present. So wanted to discuss with the group about attendance at the, the meeting on the 19th. Who, who are the four core members? It's you, my me, yeah. yeah, sorry, Chuck. You, me, Chuck, and Dave Kaplan. Okay. And is there anyone who's not eligible for quorum? Can they do the Mullen rule makeup? Nobody. No, no we, they've already, they've they've already, already done, that. done that or missed two. And then um so we have been allowed allow those other members, so for example, Mike or Brian, to vote to continue because that's a more administrative thing. And you had said, Daniel, that was okay. So we did do that. Um, but I'm, I'm assuming they, they're not vote eligible if we decide to close a hearing. They're not vote, vote eligible. We only right. have yeah. members who right. are vote eligible. Yeah, yeah, right. And and more importantly, take a vote on the application. So, okay. Right. Mm. So, so just the point is just to find out if everyone can make it uh, out of those vote eligible commissioners, and I'm I'm available. 
I am. On the 19th, I am, yes. I think it's the, is it the 19th? Or I'm the sorry. Uh, it's uh, the 19th. September 19th. Okay, yep. thank you. And we already know about David Kaplan. So, okay. So we're all set. We we should be able to maintain quorum. Okay. And the last thing on scheduling is just a reminder to complete the Tom Bay volunteer doodle for spots only that two responses. So if you are around for Tom Bay and willing to staff the booth, please click the link. I'll send a reminder around, but I want to mention it. So, um, I'll try and drop the link in there if, uh, if I get time during the meeting. But moving on to the next uh, item here, the conservation administrator staffing discussion. You will remember that back in March, our finances looked pretty bleak um, in terms of the revenues and uh, projected expenses particularly related to the uh, part-time conservation administrator, uh, Ryan Platt, who we had working for us for a time. <clears throat> and we worked with the town manager's office to try and straighten out sort of a short-term solution, which was accomplished. Um, and we, well, well, we got lucky, honestly. Ryan got a new job and, and moved to a new position and so wasn't available for that time anyway. Um, and we've sort of absorbed that extra work in the interim, knowing that we were going to look again in the future when our finances were more sound and also to have a discussion with the town manager about seeking funding for this position in a official capacity, let's say. I mean, we've, obviously we've hired that person in the past that is official but we're looking for the town to, to fund the staff position that already exists because uh, Ryan was filling it, but it was coming out of fee revenues instead of the town budget. So um, I have, sorry, Nathaniel, did you, uh, did you have a question? No, I'm sorry, I coughed. Sorry about okay. that. I'll mute. Um, um, wrote a memo, I distributed and posted um, summarizing our current financial state, which is healthy now that we've held off for six months on um, and, and that we rectified the situation with the town manager. And so we now have, I actually didn't do the math on the total. We have roughly $12,000 in the local bylaw fee and roughly four in the state fee. So around 16 thousand. It's equivalent to the amount that we spent on that role when Ryan was filling it on um, the last two fiscal years. Um, so the proposal then would be to hire a person at 10 hours per week, uh, an expected rate of about $30 per hour, projection for that within the remainder of this year would be around twelve thousand dollars, eleven seven fifty roughly. Um, and so the question to you all, of course, is to approve this expense. And I suppose also to allow me to move forward with HR negotiating how we're going to um, get this person hired. And I should clarify, this is only going to be the remainder of this fiscal year that CONCOM would have the funds in the first place to staff this position. So we're looking at now until June, and then there's a separate question about what we do with the position. That, that'll be left up to town meeting, ultimately, whether or not they will fund the position for FY26 and beyond. Um, but again, this is just the remainder of this year, and I'd be looking for a vote from you all to approve the finances and allow me to work with HR on getting somebody hired. So I'll stop there. I'll see hands going. Uh, Nathaniel Stevens. Thanks, Chuck. 
Uh, David, yeah, I'm in, in favor of this. Just a couple of questions. One which you partially partially answered is, have you run this job description by HR yet for their input? Um, so I have not put it in front of HR. It's substantially similar to the one that we hired Ryan under with a few reductions in the scope. Um, so I expect that it will be fine. And Susan, Chuck, and I put eyes on it in the revisions in advance of this discussion. So um, just, just two, two comments about that. I, I don't see anything there about the person having to provide their own transportation to get around town. I would add that. I think that's important, you know, being able to drive <laughs> and right. having, having means to get around or bicycle ride, but just some means of transportation. And I think secondly, make it clear that the person is not expected to attend Foncom meetings. I just don't think that's a good use of the limited funds okay. to do that um, on that. But otherwise, I'm in favor of this. Right. And thanks. I will note that. Thank you. Susan. Thanks, Chuck. Um, I just want to clarify for the commission and, and tell me if I'm misunderstanding our, our prior conversation, David and Chuck. There's actually two positions we're looking at. One is a temporary part-time position, 10 hours a week, which we can fund out of our fees. The Conservation Commission can fund out of our current fees through the rest of the fiscal year. And that would be similar to Orion, but a few less responsibilities. Um, then we're also proposing, and town manager has kind of given a verbal okay, that we get a half time, a, a permanent part time administrator to help David do the concom stuff that's not always getting done on time or with, we need to help them too much. <laughs> so that's a separate thing that I think David was alluding to that has to go to town meeting for approval. So I didn't want to conflate the two. There's two different positions. It, did I get that right, David and Chuck? That's true. Um, okay. I was sort of de-emphasizing the prospect of having a permanent higher in order to Sort of focus attention on the on the part time gig that's opening up or potentially opening up, um, knowing that we're not guaranteed to get that in the next fiscal year. So, but you're right; that is on the horizon. That is the difference that they would be twenty hours rather than ten is what we've requested, and we can have a separate conversation about you know roles and responsibilities when the time comes for when you know time is going to make a decision about that um it's got a lot of process to go through before we get to that stage but um interested in how folks are feeling about the temporary position for the remainder of this fiscal year thank you yeah so that's all that's on the table that would the only vote that we would have is for this temporary position. And as I understand it, it runs between whenever the hire happens and June, uh, setting this up for town meeting. I'll make a motion to approve the funds for this position in this position. I second. I say. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, Mike Gildas came? Yes. David White? Yes. David Kaplan? Yes. Brian McBride. Yes. Nathaniel Stevens. Yes. Susan Chapnick. Yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. Okay, David. Um, if you have another one. Thank you. Yeah, to... um, I have a brief one. The last meeting we heard from, um, goodness, I'm forgetting the forest school. Um, who was interested in using Meadowbrook Park as a uh, sort of home for their outdoor school. And we encouraged them to consider other conservation on properties. And 
They have since done that. They're looking around at um, you know, Bilbao, Coxalo, also the Sims Woods, where we have the conservation restriction. And I've been corresponding with them about their options for each site. And I've been corresponding with the Cemetery Commission, who clarified that their understanding is you should not legally use the cemetery for access to any other place in the cemetery. My understanding of the law is different, but um, we will suss that out next month when I meet with the Cemetery Commission, because that bears on plans that we have for Meadowbrook Park long term and uh, climate resilience improvements, flooding impacts on the cemetery and uh, other sort of recreational opportunities that have been identified there. So I wanted to report back to you on the progress that the school has made in terms of selecting the site is still undetermined, but um, also alert you to the fact of my meeting with the cemetery commission next week to, I'm sorry, next month to consider these bigger questions that came up in the process. <clears throat> That is it. Um, okay. Uh, thanks, David. Uh, a lot to think about there. Um, but uh, keep us informed about that uh, Memorial Park. I, it sounds like you're looking for a new <laughs> entrance, maybe. Okay. Now, uh, moving on to discussions. The first item tonight on the agenda is a presentation by Holtz uh, Winya. And uh, who's a PhD, environmental chemist from MDAR. Uh, the topic um, on, let me see if I get this right. Uh, yeah, we have to thank David Kaplan for making this arrangement. And we're going to be talking about glyphosate tonight. So Holtz, uh, can you unmute yourself, introduce yep. yourself for the record sure. and uh, take it away? Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, Hotsavania. Uh, I'm with the Mass Department of Agricultural uh, Resources. I'm um, uh, I'm working in the Pest and Crop Services Division, um, and and uh, that is the program where the uh, where the pesticide regulatory uh, program is part of that division, um, and that's. Uh, as an environmental chemist, um, that's where I have a role in supporting that program um, in various different, uh, um, with very different activities, um, risk assessment, uh, registration uh, review and support, um, conducting studies and assessments um, with pesticides uh, in the state. Uh, I'm also active at the national level with the Association of uh, Pesticide Control Offices, uh, where I'm uh, currently chair of um, the environmental issues um, or the environmental quality issues working committee. Uh, it's a group that meets with EPA regularly uh, to discuss pesticide related issues. Um, and I welcome the opportunity here to speak on, um, yeah, to uh, provide an overview uh, and speak on uh, glyphosate. It is, a, it is a pesticide that is getting a lot of attention. Um, also, um, we as regulators um, uh, have a role in, in making sure that uh, our regulatory program under, under those requirements that uh, glyphosate uh, meets the standards for registration. Um, and and uh, so I will provide an overview from uh, from the more in, um, a regulatory program perspective, um, and um, and what we do to make sure that um, when glyphosate is used here in Massachusetts, uh, uh, that it doesn't uh, pose unreasonable risks uh, while you know uh, it is. Um, um, used as a valuable tool in vegetation management. Um, and so uh, I'm going to share my screen if um, hopefully things work. Oops. And can you all see this? I'm going to put it in presentation mode. Um, Um, 
Is this good? Yeah. All yep, right. That looks looks good. Great. Okay, so uh, I'm actually giving a presentation that, or this this presentation, the slides that I use, uh, I, I used it earlier this year for a similar audience that was on Cape Cod. It was an audience with um, yeah professionals uh, involved in ecological restoration and also uh, people from the local concoms. Uh, and so I thought it would be uh, yeah um, useful to um, instead of uh, yeah, uh, coming up with a new presentation. These are uh, useful slides. Uh, it um, I will focus on glyphosate for that group. I also uh, talked about triclopyr, another uh, herbicide that is uh, used in ecological restoration. Um, and so um, the outline of my presentations here that I will um, I will review um, the. Uh, the process for uh, registration of pesticides uh, at the federal level, uh, which is the foundation of pesticide registration uh, in the US and then at the state level, um, what we do here uh, to, to, uh, to register pesticides, uh, what, what it involves, uh, then um, Specifically related to glyphosate, uh, I will um, review uh, some of its properties um, and also uh, the uh, the uh, the regulatory reviews that have been done recently. Um, and then um, I will go over some of the assessments and studies that uh, that we have conducted here in Massachusetts. Uh, so. First, uh, the levels uh, of review um, for registration of pesticides. So any pesticide, as you, as you may know, that uh, that uh, um, that um, is used uh, needs to be registered um, at the federal level first, and then also at the state level. Um, and then um, for certain uh, certain use patterns here in uh, Massachusetts, we, we have another special uh, review um, that we do for uh, rights of way vegetation management and for, uh, for lakes and ponds vegetation management. And so I will go over these uh, three different uh, levels of review. Um, so at the federal level, uh, EPA has the authority uh, uh, to regulate pesticides under the, the FIFRA. Um, um, and also uh, uh, it has authority uh, um, under the food, uh, the Federal Food, Drug and, and Cosmetic Act uh, re uh, relative to, uh, to uh, the setting of pesticide tolerances for all pesticides that have uses uh, in or on food. Um, so um, the, um, the Food Quality Protection Act uh, uh, that amended FIFRA uh, and uh, F FDCA um, where, EPA, where EPA must find that a pesticide poses um, a reasonable certainty of no harm before that pesticide can be registered for use uh, on feed, food or feed um, analysis. Um, it, it also, um, required a more detailed analysis of aggregate exposures, uh, cumulative effects, sensitive populations, such as infants, and, uh, and an, um, an, a closer look at the endocrine disrupting effects. Um, and so EPA's registration program um, involves an um, evaluation of new and existing pesticides, uh, registration of products for pest control, um, and ensuring that, uh, yeah, um, ensure the protection of human health and the environment. Um, and the registration of pesticide permits then the distribution, sale, and use according to specific use directions and requirements that are uh, on the product label. The product label, as you, as you may know, is a very important document. It's a legal document. Um, and uh, and so that uh, there's a lot uh, of work and, and research and uh, assessments that are behind that final document that is uh, that is on a pesticide product. Um, 
so the registration process um, at, at uh, EPA is a scientific, legal, and administrative um, um, yeah, procedure. Um, it examines the ingredients, use patterns, storage, and disposal practices, eva uh, evaluates a wide variety of, uh, of um, yeah, potential human health and environmental effects. Um, EPA requires uh, from registrants uh, when the, when a new pesticide is requested uh, is requested for registration uh, more than under uh, than 100 scientific studies uh, that uh, need to be done according to strict EPA guidelines um, and this is all coded in law uh, all the studies that uh, need to be done and uh, and so uh, the data requirements include um, you know that uh, the scientific data uh, are needed to address concerns related to the identity and composition of a pesticide product, potential adverse effects to humans and non-target organisms, and environmental fate. Um, so the types of studies that are required uh, are related to product performance, hazards to human and domestic uh, animals, hazards to other non-target organisms, uh, post-application exposure studies, uh, applicator and user exposure studies, pesticide spray drift assessments, environmental fate studies, uh, and also residue chemistry when uh, the, the, uh, the use uh, involves uh, food and feed. Um, Environmental fate studies uh, include uh, degradation studies, um, metabolic, uh, yeah, metabolism studies, um, so biodegradation in uh, aerobic and anaerobic environments, mobility studies uh, to understand uh, its leaching properties, uh, volatility, field dissipation. Uh, in both terrestrial and aquatic systems and uh, ground and surface water exposure assessments. Um, the ev evaluation for registration is then um, also includes a uh, human health risk assessment. Um, and that is based on short-term acute effects, long-term effects, such as cancer and reproductive effects, uh, aggregate uh, yeah, aggregate exposure, uh, the combined exposure from food, water, and residential exposures, um, cumulative risks, uh, risks um, that uh, may include uh, the exposure to other related pesticides, and occupational risks. Um, the effects on wildlife, fish, and plants uh, needs to be assessed and characterized. Uh, in both acute and chronic exposure scenarios. And um, there's also a specific assessment for endangered species. Um, um, relative to environmental fate, um, the, uh, um, as pesticides are released into the environment, uh, it needs to be uh, evaluated um, what the behavior is of a certain pesticide. Um, it needs to be uh, studied what the breakdown products are, metabolites and degradates, um, and uh, the potential of, uh, of a pesticide being used and then uh, exposed uh, nearby water resources is uh, carefully evaluated um, based on exposure modeling, but also monitoring studies. Um, and then a risk assessment, um, there's, there are comprehensive risk assessments that are done um, for uh, human health as well as environmental risks um, based on the compiled data sets. Um, and, and, uh, and it needs to be determined whether uh, the labeled use of a product uh, results in exposure that can cause unreasonable adverse effects. Um, and if risks are identified, uh, then uh, there's an evaluation of, uh, of, uh, of possible mitigation measures uh, to mitigate those risks. 
Uh, and then the whole risk assessment process actually also uh, undergoes peer review uh, by scientific experts, independent scientific experts. Um, and that is in the case of glyphosate, actually EPA did that uh, relative to the cancer risks um, where um, I will, I will uh, get to that later. Um, and then um, more, more info on EPA's risk assessment is um, you know, uh, the basic steps are hazard identification, how toxic is, uh, is a pesticide, um, the dose response assessment, um, the dose basically makes the poison. Um, so uh, that needs to be established what, what, that, uh, what that relationship what that relationship is, um, then an exposure assessment. What what are the levels of exposure to diet, to residential exposure, recreational um, area exposure, and uh, occupational exposure? And then uh, the final step is risk characterization, uh, which is an uh, which is an, uh, a product of you know its toxicity and the exposure level. And then, uh, based on all that information, um, um, EPA uh, uh, has to make a regulatory decision where uh, 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 whether certain pesticides can be registered for the labeled uses or if labels need to be modified or certain uh, uses uh, wouldn't be on the label due to uh, identified risks. Um, and in some cases, uh, EPA uh, uses mitigation measures such as uh, uh, making it a restricted use product. Uh, so that is only available to uh, licensed applicators. Um, and uh, in other cases, rate reductions are required, spray drift management, uh, buffers around application sites, et, et cetera. And that is language that you may find on product labels. Um, the uh, Evaluation also considers the availability of alternative pesticides for for uh, those specific uses. Um, there's coordination with uh, with uh, on on risk management with the registrants, uh, but ultimately there's a label that is produced and uh, and that needs to be approved. Um, and then um, once a pesticide is registered, uh, there is um, there is an um, there is an uh, uh, there is a requirement under the law that EPA's on a regular basis uh, on a regular cycle of uh, at least fifteen years once uh, or at least within every every, every fifteen years that EPA reevaluates uh, currently registered pesticides and so many pesticides are going through that currently uh, glyphosate is is in the final stages of that registration review um, and that that is um, in place to make sure that uh, pesticides uh, remain um, um, that that currently registered pesticides adhere to the current science and standards for protection of human health and the environment um, and then uh, in certain cases there are special reviews that the EPA conducts uh, that that uh, may be done uh, if, if uh, unreasonable adverse effects occur and uh, that uh, the, the agency uh, determines that a special review is needed. At the state level then, uh, registration and evaluation at the state level, uh, our, de our department uh, has the authority to regulate pesticides in Massachusetts. Um, it registers pesticides, it licenses uh, and certifies uh, applicators. Um, it, uh, it has an enforcement uh, program uh, working with federal and, and state laws to, uh, to enforce uh, regulations. Um, and ultimately the pesticide program, uh, its objective is to regulate the use of pesticides in the state uh, have the tools available for pest control that is needed, but also uh, protect human health and the environment. Um, so the registration of pesticides at the state level is, is done by uh, the pesticide board subcommittee. That is the entity that has the authority to register um, 
pesticides and, and uh, if needed, make pesticides more restricted um, than what the EPA may do. Um, so there are five members on this board. Uh, uh, um, the director of the Food Protection Program um, is the chairperson and then uh, commissioners of uh, MDAR, DPAs and DCR uh, are uh, or their designees and uh, a commercial applicator is uh, is a member. Um, and so, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the subcommittee can determine whether uh, if, if it decides to register uh, a pesticide, whether, well, um, first of all, uh, the subcommittee determines you know, whether there is a potential cause for unreasonable adverse effects when used as labeled in, in Massachusetts. Every state has their unique uh, situations and, um, and uh, that may not be addressed by by EPA or states can be more uh, stricter than EPA. Uh, and that uh, happens in certain cases. Uh, and so we, uh, the pesticide board subcommittee can uh, decide not to register a product uh, or um, uh, just register the product and leave it unclassified. That means uh, for general use, uh, you don't need to have a license uh, in that case or um, it may be uh, classified as a restricted use pesticide. Um, and that uh, may be based on uh, its potential to maybe uh, impact groundwater resources or other uh, reasons. Um, and in certain cases, there is an, uh, what is known as a special local needs uh, registration where uh, a supplemental label is added to address uh, specific situations uh, in Massachusetts. For example, uh, cranberry growing is a kind of a unique uh, growing system that sometimes uh, requires tweaking of federal labels or supplemental labels to to uh, to make it work uh, in in uh, in that unique situation. And uh, I mentioned the groundwater uh, uh, um, the. Yeah, potential uh, for pesticides to impact groundwater resources. We have special regulations uh, to protect uh, public, yeah, public water supplies, um, and certain certain herbicides are uh, prohibited uh, to be used in in uh, in the uh, recharge areas, um, regulated recharge areas. So this is a list of pesticides that are uh, prohibited from uh, use. Uh, in, in those areas. They are all uh, reclassified as a state restricted use or federally restricted use product. Uh, one can should note that glyphosate is not on this list. Uh, glyphosate, as I will uh, explain later, is, is not an, um, a pesticide that, uh, that uh, tends to lead or, uh, into groundwater and uh, and uh, also doesn't have uh, toxicity levels that uh, that meet those criteria. Then, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there is for certain uh, use patterns um, we have uh, um, we still have another level of review, um, and that are herbicides that are used in rights away management. Um, that is uh, known as the list uh, or the sensitive area materials list. There is a list of herbicides th that can be used in rights away within sensitive areas of rights away. Um, relative to aquatic herbicides for use in lakes and ponds, um, uh, as you may know, that's permitted by MassDEP, but there's a list, uh, there's a special review uh, for um, for herbicides that are on that list that are available for permitted use. And we we uh, we have a joint review process working with MassDEP um, to review those, uh, those uh, herbicides. Um, and that, that is an, um, that is a process where basically we, we, we take another look at uh, the properties and, and information for, uh, for those herbicides. Um, also look at the open literature, scientific literature. Um, and um, and uh, uh, in addition to the active ingredients uh, where 
the pesticide board subcommittee uh, focuses on the active ingredients. Uh, here with this review, we look at the active ingredients as well as uh, the other ingredients that make up a formulation. Um, and, um, and so that is, uh, that is part of that additional uh, level of review. Um, and so uh, there are specific reg regulations for rights away management uh, and sensitive areas are defined there. And um, in those areas, only herbicides uh, that are listed on the on the uh, sensitive area materials list uh, shall be shall be used. And that review process is following uh, the, the guidance and criteria outlined in a cooperative agreement uh, between the two agencies. Um, so th there is the sensitive area, area materials list, um, uh, that is available on our website and that includes, um, these herbicides and there are a few others, but, uh, as, uh, as you can see, it's highlighted here that glyphosate is on that list. So that is an herbicide that can be used in the sensitive areas. Um. And so uh, there's a protocol um, uh, established for review of active ingredients. Uh, I'm going to uh, go over the details here, but um, the, 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 the important properties are um, looked at uh, and uh, assessed. Um, and then um, in some cases we, um, we, uh, we do, um, uh, we do some uh, specific modeling um, to uh, to address the specific situation here in Massachusetts, uh, and that is that is uh, part of that uh, more refined review, more specific review uh, for uh, for the rights away program. Um, as I mentioned, we uh, we look at other ingredients in the formulations. Uh, the you may know that uh, that is uh, that is not disclosed on the product label. That is confidential business information. Uh, but um, for this level, uh, for, for this review, we we actually obtain uh, that information and uh, and take a look at what the other ingredients are and if there are any concerns for impacts uh, 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 to um, uh, human health and the environment in general. It should be noted that EPA looks at that too, uh, but uh, it is not disclosed on the label what those ingredients are. But they are evaluated. And so this is an uh, overview of the process for rights away herbicides, highlighting that we, uh, that we look both at active ingredients as well as uh, other ingredients um, and then uh, um, come to a decision whether a product that is requested uh, for that list is acceptable or not acceptable. And so this is a screenshot of, um, of the current um, or a recent version of, uh, I think that is still the same. Uh, as you can see, glyphosate is included on that list. Uh, and you can find more details on, on the actual products that are uh, on the list. And then a uh, similar thing we do for aquatic herbicides that are used uh, in, in lakes and ponds for vegetation management and in face species. Uh, and, um, and so um, uh, that, is, uh, that is a list of herbicides uh, that, uh, that, um, that uh, MassDEP looks at when, when requests come in for uh, or for permits to use uh, herbicides in uh, lakes and ponds. And this is uh, a screenshot shot of that list uh, where uh, glyphosate again is listed. Uh, that is an, one of the uh, products that can be used in lakes and ponds. Um, so uh, in summary, uh, um, the regulatory review for registration. Um, uh, we, we, we have besides the, uh, the, the, the registration uh, and evaluation at the federal and state level, we have here in Massachusetts that, that uh, review uh, for these use patterns. Um, and um, uh, that is just another layer um, 
of of uh, of uh, of refuel that uh, that further uh, make sure that the use of those uh, those uh, herbicides um, ensures that um, the products can be used uh, without unreasonable impacts to human health and and the environment uh, from uh, from the selective use of these herbicides, um, and thereby it allows the benefits of the selective use of these herbicides uh, to conduct the uh, the vegetation management um, that is needed in in the, in these situations. Um, the 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 uh, as I pointed out, the sensitive area materials list is is uh, from a regulatory point is is uh, is is only relevant to rights of way vegetation management. However, um, uh, many people look at that list uh, as an as an as a list that uh, that provides uh, products um, that that have under undergone that additional uh, level of refill and. Um, and and so um, that that list is uh, uh, that that list certainly has value uh, to uh, to look at and uh, select products from uh, as it as it uh, typically facilitates the acceptance uh, of the use of those tools those specific herbicides. Then specifically uh, related to glyphosate. Um, so glyphosate has been around for more than five decades now, um, and uh, it is a, fair, a widely used non-selective herbicide. Uh, mode of action is uh, is uh, by uh, by inhibition of a plant enzyme um, um, that is that is again it is plant specific uh, the mode of action, um, or uh, it is only occurring in in plants. Uh, the uh, acute toxicity profile, uh, the mammalian uh, toxicity profile, uh, is is uh, that it has low toxicity by oral exposure, um, low toxicity by dermal exposure. Uh, it's not a skin sensitizer. It is very low by inhalation, uh, very low toxicity by inhalation, and uh, there's certain product formulations uh, due to the presence of some other um, ingredients may cause irritation uh, um, to skin and eyes, and the label will have those uh, that that uh, that language on there. Um, the chronic toxicity, um, dog studies, and other animal studies have have provided data that that are used, uh, you know, by EPA to uh, to set certain levels. Uh, for uh, exposure that is tolerated or not, um, and so all these, these these studies provide information that is then used to uh, to set uh, certain levels that are considered to be uh, uh, a no effect uh, uh, exposure level um, or an uh, an uh, an certain uh, level that is uh, that is then uh, used to uh, to further refine. Um, risk assessments. Um, so uh, developmental and reproductive effects are evaluated uh, and it was determined for glyphosate that, uh, that there are no developmental and uh, reproductive effects at the level associated with labeled uses. Uh, relative to carcinogenicity, animal studies have not shown evidence that exposure to glyphosate is linked to cancer. Um, and therefore, it is classified as not likely to be carcinogenic to humans. Um, the uh, relative to endocrine disruption, uh, there's no evidence of effects uh, based on the existing data. Uh, EPA is still uh, working on uh, on uh, doing additional testing uh, to meet the current standards for endo for endocrine disruption testing. Uh, that is. Uh, that is something that still needs to be done as part of registration review. Um, relative to the fate in the human body, uh, any glyphosate uh, taken in through the skin or mouth goes through the body within uh, less than uh, than a day. So it is not uh, something that is accumulating. Um, relative to environmental fate, uh, it is not a persistent chemical. It breaks down uh, due to microbial uh, activity. Um, 
and uh, typical fields have live ranges, uh, um, ranges from, yeah, um, it, it is like uh, about seven to 10 days to the, the longer uh, have lifetimes measured in certain conditions, uh, under certain conditions is uh, up to 47 days. Um, it binds very strongly to soil and therefore generally is immobile in soil. In water, it it it, uh, it breaks down with a somewhat uh, longer half life, um, depending on the conditions. Again, it ranges from a few days to ninety days. Um, there's no significant exposure uh, uh, through and uh, through air expected because it is a very uh, it, the compound compound has very low uh, volatility uh, relative to um, um, ecotoxicity, uh, it's practically non-toxic to birds, uh, slightly to practically non-toxic to fish. Um, um, aquatic invertebrates also slightly to practically non-toxic amphibians. Uh, it's moderately, moderately to slightly toxic to uh, certain product formulations. Um, and again, that's where the other ingredients come into play. Uh, that that uh, actually uh, can be more toxic. Uh, honeybees in general also uh, the toxicity is classified as being non uh, practically non toxic as well as uh, to earth to earthworms. Um, so um, I mentioned the registration review uh, and uh, glyphosate is 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 going through that. Um, that is in its final stages. Um, it is a comprehensive re-evaluation re of all the information and additional studies uh, uh, are typically required as, as new uh, requirements have, have been put in place uh, and new standards have to be met. Um, in 2017, EPA convened actually a scientific advisory panel of independent scientists uh, to uh, to take another look at the carcinogenicity data and studies. Uh, so that was an extra thing that was part of this registration review. And then in 2019, EPA issued a proposed interim decision. Uh, interim decision um, is, is used by EPA to uh, put in place, uh, based on the work that was done so far, uh, to uh, put in place uh, restrictions or any um, updates to labels that EPA things are needed, um, while some some of the other work still is ongoing. Um, so they issued in 2020 an interim decision. Um, however, uh, that was challenged in the courts and ultimately uh, as part of legal maneuvering, it was retracted. Um, EPA continues uh, the registration review and, uh, and it will, uh, it plans to uh, to uh, issue a final decision uh, in 2026. Some of uh, the, these are some slides of uh, of, uh, of uh, other uh, regulatory programs and research agencies around the world that uh, have looked at glyphosate. Um, again, it's a widely used herbicide around the world, uh, and so it is. Uh, it is interesting to uh, to look at that what what other agencies find and i'm not going to um, uh, read this all uh, but it it provides context of uh, of, uh, of what the epa has has concluded uh, so far um, and um, and 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 uh, and what other agencies around the world uh, have concluded based on the review of glyphosate and its and all the studies that are done um, and so EPA concludes that uh, there's that it is not uh, likely to be carcinogenic to humans, and um, that are that there are no other meaningful risks to human health when the product is used according to the pesticide label. Um, and uh, relative to uh, to the uh, cancer risk, again, it is classified as not likely uh, to be carcinogenic to humans. Um, and uh, one can see when when I go through these uh, slides uh, that other agencies around the world come to similar conclusions. 
there's no uh, strong evidence that uh, glyphosate uh, is is a risk for uh, is is carcinogenic to humans uh, when used according to label instructions. Um, in Europe, uh, last year they they uh, after five six year review process, um, they came to that conclude that they. they uh, they already had concluded that earlier, but that was confirmed by uh, by another uh, round of review that uh, uh, basically there are no critical areas of concern uh, with respect to um, the impact of glyphosate to human health, animals, and the environment. Um, based on uh, and this is a very large, you know, they they looked at um, more uh, more than twenty five hundred um, studies. Um, that uh, were done with glyphosate, and uh, and so that was an um, that was a, a concluded last year, and glyphosate is uh, registered for another ten years in Europe. Um, other agencies again come to similar conclusions relative to risks um, and and uh, uh, to human health and the environment from glyphosate use. Um, then there is the. Uh, uh, so those are all risk assessments. Um, so they consider exposure and toxicity and determine the risk. Um, there was an, that, that there's a study that was published um, in, nine, in in 2018, uh, the, which is known as the Agricultural Health Study um, that followed uh, more than 50,000 pesticide applicators since 1993. And uh, that's where they also conclude there is, uh, there's no link between glyphosate exposure and uh, certain uh, um, tumors. Um, and so that was, an, uh, that was uh, something that uh, EPA also uh, uh, reviewed and included in their uh, evaluation. Uh, one risk, one, assessment that is getting a lot of attention, certainly in the context of litigation, um, is the assessment uh, that came out in 2015. So that is uh, now almost 10 years ago. Um, that's, um, that's the only group that came to a different conclusion that uh, based on limited evidence in humans uh, for, carcinogenicity, for carcinogenicity of glyphosate, uh, um, they concluded basically that uh, glyphosate was was classified as a probable carcino, uh, probable, probably carcinogenic to humans, uh, you know, and that is in the same category as eating red meat, uh, drinking hot beverages, and uh, working as a barber, for example. Anyway, um, that is, uh, as you can see, is an outlier. And it, it should be noted that was not a risk assessment. It was just a hazard assessment. So um, so that is, uh, that is again, something to note. Uh, but this is, this is what is used in, in many of the litigation efforts uh, related to glyphosate. Um, I already talked about this EPA's uh, proposed interim decision. Um, again, uh, result of a very rigorous process um, and um, where they concluded that there are no uh, unreasonable risks to human health, uh, including uh, that it was protective of children. Uh, ecological risks uh, were also um, there are slight risks uh, only at, at very high application rates in certain scenarios um, relative to honeybees and other pollinators. There are some uncertainty in the existing risk, risk assessments, uh, subletal effects, and, and there are some new data requirements that are uh, being now uh, worked on uh, by registrants to submit uh, additional data to refine this risk assessment. And then, uh, um, there's as as it is a uh, non-specific herbicide. It uh, any green plant is is basically sensitive uh, in, in a certain in certain growing stages to uh, herb to glyphosate. Um, um, there is a risk to non-target plants uh, in many situations, but that um, to, uh, that can be mitigated by making sure that the product only uh, lands on the plants that you would, uh, that you want. To have controlled and minimize the spray drift uh, to uh, non-target plants. 
relative to aquatic life, it is uh, EPA points out that certain formulation can pose a risk. But again, that is uh, more related to the other ingredients and uh, product labels will have um, language on there that addresses that. The interim decision uh, was uh, issued in 2020. Again, that was um, um, uh, to to get some uh, some uh, some uh, early uh, mitigation language uh, on the label where needed. Uh, but uh, again, it was challenged in the court, uh, and um, it was retracted, and it will be finalized in, in a few years. Relative to endangered species, EPA is required to uh, assess the risk of pesticides to uh, to endangered species uh, under the uh, Endangered Species Act, and uh, EPA is um, is working on um, on that for glyphosate. Uh, the first part of that process is to uh, conduct on uh, what is known as a biological evaluation or uh, Again, this is for federally listed and endangered species, which is a screening level assessment uh, to uh, to identify potential impacts to federally listed species, and then uh, that work informs uh, the work uh, the work that needs to be done by EPA in consultation with uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services and Marine Fisheries Services to inform the assessments. Uh, uh, of potential jeopardy to the species or their critical uh, their critical imp, uh, habitat, and uh, that work is ongoing at this time, uh, and that will be uh, then uh, the findings will become available in uh, in what is known as a biological opinion, which EPA then uses to update labels uh, to address again the endangered species risk. Um, Oh yeah, um, the U.S. Forest Service also has conducted uh, risk assessments specifically for their use patterns, um, where they use glyphosate, um, and um, we actually, for the rights away fact sheets, we have linked to their uh, risk assessments as they were more recent than the ones uh, that we did uh, 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 some some decades ago. So that's why I kept it in here, but. Um, as as uh, as we refer to them uh, in our fact sheets, uh, but it, it is it is another agency that conducts risk assessments, but has a focus um, for uh, uh, the use patterns, and that includes uh, invasives, in invasives and noxious weeds. Uh, so that's why it is in uh, in 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 the context of this presentation, I thought it would uh, be helpful to mention, and. Um, and so they also um, find, oh, well, they go through the risk assessments uh, for their scenarios. And um, and so overall, uh, they find generally a low risk, um, except in, in some specific situations. Um, and also related to disinfectant again, that, that, uh, that may be part of the formulation. Um, then um, some of the work that our department has done uh, to uh, to further support the regulatory program. Uh, from time to time, we 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 uh, we uh, we do studies to uh, to take a look at what is going on specifically here in the state in terms of what what uh, what is uh, what is uh, ending up in 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 water resources. Uh, we. Do uh, modeling assessments, we uh, monitoring studies, and uh, reviews of the scientific literature, um, and so I'm just going over uh, some of them quickly. Um, uh, for glyphosate, uh, there was a monitoring study for the rights of way management in 2004, where there was no detection of glyphosate residue in in uh, in uh, streams uh, adjacent to areas where rights of way applications uh, had been done that was a railway scenario i believe um there was the uh, what is known as the barnstable rights of way advisory committee that uh, convened in 2010 11 to address the concerns for rights of way herbicides on cape cod mm -hmm. um there was an assessment for rights of way herbicides um, 
we did a monitoring study uh, on Cape Cod in some public water supplies um, to get an idea of uh, whether I write rights away and some other herbicides um, uh, reach the groundwater. And we did a study uh, recently uh, on uh, working with public water suppliers to uh, to do a more statewide uh, sampling for specifically for glyphosate. And so the Barnstable ad hoc committee work, uh, uh, we did some modeling uh, to evaluate the potential of uh, uh, rights away herbicides, including glyphosate, um, what the exposure to ground and surface water could be uh, using EPA models that are designed to do that. Um, and so for glyphosate, um, the, uh, just this shows the, uh, how it's uh, how uh, how it migrates into the profile, basically showing that glyphosate that glyphosate does not really uh, have a tendency to move down even in a sandy soil, as as uh, as is common on on Cape Cod. Uh, it it has such a strong binding uh, affinity to uh, soil uh, materials that it it uh, it doesn't leach down. Uh, uh, much at all. Some other modeling where you can actually uh, estimate or simulate what, what uh, based on a certain uh, well depth and, and uh, groundwater depth, you can simulate what potential concentrations on, in worst case scenarios could be. Um, and, and I've done that here for a few um, herbicides, um, glyphosate, uh, again, is the lowest here in this range because it's again it binds very strongly to soil, um, and these are the uh, health-based standards or health values for uh, these uh, herbicides. And again, uh, looking, these numbers are well, well below uh, health standards, so they were not of concern. But uh, and then the same thing for surface water, um, where. Wait, this, these are ecological benchmarks. Um, oh yeah, so it, it was the surface water we focused on uh, the impacts, potential impacts to uh, ecological uh, non-targets. Um, also below levels of concern for uh, those endpoints. Then we did a uh, monitoring study on Cape Cod, looking at rights away uh, herbicides in um, some public water supply wells. We did um, sampling from you know 2018 through uh, 2021, um, and the results uh, showed no detection of any of the rights away herbicides. Uh, there were a few detections of some other herbicide or pesticides that we included, um, but they were at levels that were uh, well below uh, uh, concerns for drinking water. Um, Oh yeah, then uh, with all the attention to glyphosate, um, uh, the pesticide board subcommittee, again, the, the entity that registers pesticides and also can, uh, if needed, restrict uh, its uses, um, initiated an, uh, what is known as an individual review, which uh, is the regulatory uh, term to take another look or close to look whether this this uh, pesticide meets the registration standards uh, that are defined in in, uh, in our regulations. Um, that was initiated in 2020, and um, that's where the uh, the uh, that's that's where uh, the interest was to do another more statewide monitoring study for glyphosate in water supplies, um, and additional information. Uh, uh, will also be uh, considered uh, as part of that individual review. And then the Glyphosate Commission was formed uh, a few years ago by the legislator uh, to uh, to basically conduct a scientific review of the, of the potential impacts of glyphosate uh, use in Massachusetts. Uh, that's a multi-agency effort led by MassDEP. Um, that is still ongoing, but it's in the final stages. I will have a slide on that. Um, the glyphosate monitoring studies, uh, the statewide study um, um, where we uh, worked with uh, 25 water suppliers um, across the state to uh, 
to uh, see if if uh, if glyphosate residues show up. Uh, and so uh, we did uh, monthly sampling uh, for one year, and um, the results um, were that there were no detections uh, of glyphosate or its targeted uh, EMPA in any of those samples. Um, so this is information that will be uh, provided to the subcommittee for their evaluation uh, along with other information. Um, the Glyphosate Commission I mentioned, um, it was charged with uh, conducting a scientific review of uses, impacts, and al alternatives um, um, for its uses. Uh, the pesticide committee, uh, the, the pesticide board subcommittee uh, is also uh, is charged to conduct an individual review of glyphosate using the scientific review from uh, uh, that is that is produced um, uh, by the uh, that that is a result of the uh, scientific review, and then uh, the results will also be uh, submitted to the joint committees of environmental, natural resources, and agriculture. Um, the progress, um, I mentioned it, it's in the final stages, but it was in uh, the Eastern Research Group was contracted to do this scientific review. Um, and so they produced a uh, phase one report um, then uh, that, that defined the scope and resources uh, of the project. And then the phase two report that is currently um, uh, in its final uh, stages to be uh, reviewed and approved by the glyphosate commission uh, is the actual review um, that was uh, out for public comment earlier this year um, as well as uh, the, the phase one was out for public comment too um, the final phase two report will be presented and discussed at the next commission meeting that is september 17. So you can find uh, information. You can find the report online if you Google, uh, if you search for Glyphosate Commission, Massachusetts. Uh, you, it will bring you right there. So a summary. In summary, um, glyphosate and 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 other herbicides used for vegetation control, including invasive species control, undergo a rigorous regulatory review. Um, herbicide properties and effects. Uh, um, uh, of glyphosate have been uh, well characterized. Um, risk assessments indicate low risks for human uh, human health and uh, non-target organisms, except plants, of course. Again, it's it's uh, it's an it's a very effective uh, herbicide to control green growing plants. Um, Following all applicable regulations and label instructions should provide sufficient protection uh, while allowing the herbicide to be used as an effective tool in vegetation management. And so I have some resources listed there here, but um, this is uh, what I, I wanted to share with you here. And hopefully this is helpful uh, for, uh, for your evaluation of uh, when the request for the use of glyphosate um, uh, need to be considered and I, I'm uh, available to answer any questions that you may have or follow up later on if you want to reach out to me. Sure, I see that Susan Hands is up. Uh, I would just first wanted to say thank you, Dr. Havania. Um, that was uh, uh, quite a good presentation and I appreciate it being, uh, you know, at least uh, on to, on glyphosate, which is what this commission is concerned about. Yeah. Before we get into questions, I do want to let everyone know that this has been about an hour and we do have other things on our agenda. So I know Susan would most likely be the one to ask the question. So Susan, uh, briefly, please. Thank you. And thank you again for this presentation. It was a whirlwind sure. tour of glyphosate. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I have I have two questions and and hopefully they're not too long and if they are long maybe we could we could connect at a separate yeah. time because I would be really interested in understanding um more and and I would hope that you would be able to let us share this presentation um, yeah that's just, yeah that's okay awesome. thank you yeah. so that would be helpful to me because I didn't take all the notes um so so two questions one um 
I, I do understand that EPA is redoing um, their registration of glyphosate right now, and I'm glad that Massachusetts is studying it. My understanding from the from what they put out, the interim decision on the biological evaluation that came out yeah. in 2021 really did show some significant impacts to um, endangered target species, um, which is a concern of ours, yeah. obviously, in, in certain of our water bodies and, yeah. and jurisdictional areas. Um, so that's a concern of mine. The, the, the other, that's just a comment. The question is, um, it seems to me that the formulations of glyphosate can have different toxicities. And yep. we struggle as a commission with um, considering the impacts of these different formulations. There's Aquanit, there's um, a, a different one. I forgot what the other one, Aquapro. They, mm -hmm. I mean, they have different, there's different glyphosate formulations, this Roundup. Yep. Do you have any um, recommendations for us on how to evaluate the different formulations when we're permitting a project on or near our water bodies? Well, uh, one one major uh, one major aspect to uh, to look at when you evaluate these products is to look uh, at um, whether the label uh, allows terrestrial uses or um, or aquatic uses. Uh, actually, um, formulations or there are formulations or there are products that are labeled for aquatic use, um, and those are the ones that that uh, do not have the surfactants in them. Because um, surfactant or EPA would not allow labeling for aquatic uses um, uh, if if uh, surfactants are present in a formulation. Because it is known that surfactants are actually much much more are much more toxic uh, to aquatic organisms compared to glyphosate. Uh, glyphosate, as I pointed out, uh, is not that toxic to aquatic organisms, um, and so that. That uh, again, it goes back to the label. Um, a, a product that is labeled for aquatic uses is is, is uh, has has been uh, evaluated for that purpose, and and uh, EPA uh, makes sure that the formulation uh, is as a whole is not toxic to aquatic organisms. So that is one uh, important aspect uh, to look at when you uh, when you consider. It's used in in, uh, in in water bodies or wetlands. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Brian McBride. Yeah. yeah, just just a quick comment. Thank you. That was a great presentation. It really sets my mind to ease. I guess my only comment is uh, the resources that the EPA and the Massachusetts government have to put behind these studies are really impressive. Um, I can, I can just imagine the years of study it takes to make a educated decision on a pesticide like this. And I really feel like we need to defer to your expertise on these situations because it's impossible even for someone like myself who is educated in chemistry and some environmental science yeah. to make a good decision without the resources that you all have. So I really applaud that. Right. Okay. Uh, I don't see any more questions. And uh, Mike, uh, Mike, Mike has, Mike has his hand. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sure. Mike. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, thank you for that very detailed and comprehensive presentation. And uh, what you provided is uh, very important. I was under the impression, and I may be entirely mistaken, that some agency, environmental or public health agency in the European Union had banned the use of glyphosate, uh, at least recently. And that may be new, uh, old information. But I don't know if any of the studies that the European countries have done have uh, been applied or used in the assessments that uh, EPA or the state have done. Well, uh, EPA also uh, conducts a very comprehensive uh, literature study um, studies uh, and or literature searches to make sure that uh, whenever they come out with assessments that they have. Um, have considered um, any any study that is of sufficient quality, um, because there are there are studies out there that are um, 
that that EPA will take a look at and then um, uh, determines that you know studies are not of sufficient quality uh, mm. to to be used for risk assessment purposes. Um, so, but um, yeah, so EPA um, uh, certainly um, uh, looks at what uh, what uh, other regulatory agencies uh, do they they actually for other pesticides they they, they frequently collaborate uh, on on uh, refuse so they uh, they they share resources um, so they are certainly aware of of uh, what what uh, has been uh, re reviewed and and uh, uh, by the european uh, agencies yeah so the uh, so i guess i was misinformed that some european agency had banned the use of glyphosate is that uh the 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 assessments um that are done by the european um regulatory agencies those are the ones that i shared and and pointed out to you there are at the local level uh maybe agencies that um are uh, certainly at a local level and e even uh, member states still have the ability to decide uh, or actually um um to decide to restrict glyphosate more than than what what uh, uh, what the uh, the uh, the union wide uh, agency has has uh, has reviewed and concluded so member states still um have that ability to be more restrictive and so that that may be a case here and then at a local level um they also have the ability to restrict um um Good, thank you. Life safe. Okay, you're welcome. Uh, we're going to have to move on, Susan. Yeah, Maybe okay. uh, other uh, others can have uh, an offline conversation. Sure. I I just wanted to finish off with one question that I had uh, been wondering about: Is there such thing as a non-ionic surfactant? Yes. And there if is. It, so yeah. if you used glyphosate custom with a non-ionic surfactant, would that be aquatic safe? Um, that, uh, that depends on whether the, the, um, the surfactant is labeled for aquatic use. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, the, uh, in, in certain situations, what is done is they, they take the, the glyphosate product um, and the label may suggest to use uh, a certain surfactant. Um, and it typically the label specified or points out that uh, the, the, the applicator has to make sure that the surfactant that is being used um, is, is the appropriate or is, is labeled for, uh, uh, say, aquatic use. Or, or or any use pattern that you are considering. So you have to make sure that the surfactant uh, product that is used uh, is is uh, is labeled for uh, the use pattern that you are considering. And and it is it is uh, important to point out that the the the, uh, the surfactants that you buy separately are not regulated pesticides. So that's that's uh, that is just something that we uh, as agency do not um, we don't rest uh, we don't register those we don't review those so uh, it is important to um, take a close to take a close look at the labeling of of those products too all right thank you and uh, thank you for your presentation i, I think that we can all see uh, the contact information right. on the screen yep. and uh uh, it was it was great. I appreciate you being here, but uh, we're going to be moving on to our yep. next agenda item. Okay. Uh, thank yeah, you. Yeah, hand yeah. clap for uh, Nathaniel Stevens. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Yep. All right. Bye now. Uh, moving on, um, we have Thorndike Place DEP file number ninety one zero three five six. This is a continuation from the August fifteenth conservation meeting in which it was continued. The applicant uh, for Thornike Place has informed the commission after receiving this latest information that they are preparing a response. Uh, this is all to say we will not be hearing uh, any discussion from Thornike Place tonight. Um, we will hear more discussion at our next meeting, which is September 19th. And the applicant sent an email today confirming that 
checked um, all the correspondence for the for this agenda item can be found on the conservation uh, page and under Thorndike Place. And if you have any questions or concerns about that or can't reach our information, uh, you should reach out to David Morgan. I do want to note that new information did come in and there's been an update um, uh, between the last two meetings. So you can go and check that out, which was something sent to us by Scott Horsley and Michael Mobile. And that was on August 23rd, 2024. Okay. And with that, can I get a, uh, a motion to- Motion to continue. I assume that the applicant requested the continuance. Absolutely. Yep, motion to continue to the 19th of September. Can I have a second? Second. Okay, that was David Kaplan. Uh, Mike Gildas Game? Yes. Susan Chapnick? Yes. Dave Kaplan? Yes. Brian McBride? Yes. Nathaniel Stevens? Yes. Mike Gildas Game? I already said yes. Sure, and Chuck Taroni says yes. <laughs> oh, it was David Kaplan that. Uh, Second. Okay, great. That's that for uh, Thorndike Place. And we're going to be moving on to our next agenda item, which is a notice of intent for Spy Pond for 49 Spy Pond Lane. Okay, well, David uh, lets the applicants in. I'll just read the blurb. Uh, the Conservation Commission will hold a public hearing to consider a notice of intent under the Wetlands Protection Act and the Arlington Bylaw for Wetlands Protection for the construction of a deck at 49 Spy Pond Lane. Um, area response, um, so 49 Spy Pond Lane. Uh, the areas that are uh, altered are buffer zone and adjacent upland resource area. I checked this afternoon and I want to ask David Morgan if he also checked that the DEP file number hasn't been issued. And he can check he can check right now. And so I want to let you know that this is a continuation of sorts because in August of 2024, the Conservation Commission heard the same request under a request for determination of applicability, an RDA. The results of that determination was that we asked for a notice of intent. I believe the applicant is here from 49 Spy Pond Lane. And if you could turn on your mic, introduce yourself for the Conservation Commission and the record and bring us up to speed with your project. Yeah, good evening, everybody. I'm uh, Kevin, I live at 49 Spy Pond Lane. And as Chuck mentioned uh, a few months back, we prevented, presented an RDA on a deck. Um, so if you're okay, I'll go ahead and throw a, a couple of images just to kind of show Absolutely. Where, where we were and what we're doing now. So let me do that. Okay, so can everyone see this, uh, this plane yes. right now? Okay, so originally, uh, I think it was a, a few months back at this point, we, prevent, we presented uh, a design that is shown here. Um, so this was at ground level, um, so it was a composite uh, deck, and uh, it was about, you know, 20 some feet away from the house, uh, 18 feet wide. Um, the feedback, you know, we got a, a couple pieces of feedback. I think uh, the parts that really resonated with me was just some advice I got from, from Chuck and some others um, on how we could make this lower impact. So the design we're presenting now is smaller. So this is uh, what's in the, the uh, notice of intent. Uh, the deck is a couple of major changes here. Uh, it's no longer at ground level. It's now up um, one level above the ground. And it's also less than half the size. So you can see the previous one was, was uh, about 21 feet uh, from the house uh, lengthwise. Uh, and this one is closer to about nine feet on average. So uh, it's much smaller. Uh, and it's much higher, meaning that uh, we think this should have uh, you know very low impact on the flora and fauna. Um, we've also proposed some mitigation plantings, so some uh, native non-cultivar plantings uh, that we would add to kind of offset here. Uh, so two uh, eastern red cedar trees, uh, four inkberry bushes, uh, and some Pennsylvania sedge decorative grasses. So let me bring up the design document. I can show that off a little bit better with the PDF here.
All right, so here's a closer look at the site plan. Um, just to give you some reference, you know, the, the road is here down. Can you guys see my, my uh, mouse? Yes. So at the bottom of the page is the road. At the upper kind of left is where the pond is. The house is basically kind of in the middle here. Uh, and all the new additions are here. So let me zoom in a little bit here so you can better get a better look. So this is now the new deck. Um, you know, it's relatively small compared to the original. There is also an existing permeable patio underneath here. That's still at the ground level. Um, stairs remain the same. Uh, and plantings, uh, the, 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 the light blue cyan stuff here already exists, but everything in green is proposed as new plantings. Uh, so these are the, the eastern red cedar, um, kind of evergreen trees uh, that are non-invasive. Four inkberry bushes, again, non-invasive. Uh, and then I don't have it in here, but we'll also have some, some um, you know, kind of decorative grasses here. So, uh, you know, it should be the square footage of, I think, the plantings as they reach maturity will exceed the, the deck size. Um, so, yeah, that's the basic presentation. Is there any, uh, I don't know if you want to know anything more about the deck. Leary is here as well. He can speak to that. He's, he works with Archer Deck. Sure, Kevin. Why don't we open it up to the commission for some questions, and we can pin, pinpoint any of the, any of those uh, questions that people have. I see Susan Chapnick has her hand up. Thank you, Chuck. Um, thank you for that explanation. I appreciate your taking into um, account what we said previously about having a lower impact on this site. Um, so I do appreciate that. I have a few questions. One is the square footage of the deck, if you could just remind us of what that is and what the deck is made of and what it's going to be standing on. Yeah. Uh, Larry, you want to hop in and talk about the construction? I think he's... Uh, Larry, you're muted. So this is, of course, a wood frame construction, as all decks are. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be attached to the house at the upper, at the uh, first floor level, which is in this case roughly about nine feet above the ground. Yeah, yeah, and then it will be clad. It will be decked and clad with synthetic materials, you know, <clears throat> which will be both permeable. Yeah, you know, as we've discussed before, there's spacing gaps between all the deck boards, yeah, you know, so that rainwater will you know, will flow right through. Yeah, and in this case, we'll be doing stainless steel table rails you know, around you know, for safety as is required. Yeah, yeah, we had mentioned previously we install, you know, we'll be installing helical piers for the footings. So it's essentially no excavation whatsoever. Yeah, you know, those spin right into the ground you know, with a very light footprint of the machine that you know, installs. You know, and, and square footage. That's... Square footage is around 180 square feet, I believe. The original design was like 400 square feet. 176 square feet. Okay. Thank you. One's, Answered one's all my questions. Six. Okay. And your um and underneath the deck is remaining the same as what you have now. No change. Right. Okay. Yeah, Thank no you. change to that. Thank you. Any other question from commission members? Can I jump in with a question related to the permeable patio? Is there space underneath there in order to maintain that if there's a deck on top? Uh, it sounds like, Larry, you said it was at nine feet where the deck joins the structure. And um, just you know, I'm not familiar with how it's being maintained. So yeah, know. there's a there's a full walkout basement below this. So I mean, there's a there's a full height slider. Yeah, and the small patio is right in front of the slider. Got it. Okay. So thank so you. So complete room for anything, any maintenance. Cool. Yeah, and it's also open, right? Besides those three posts, uh, you know, you can walk underneath the deck uh, easily. Great. Uh, any other questions? I'm gonna. Quickly turn to people attending tonight's meeting and ask if there are anyone that's attended tonight me tonight's meeting that would like to ask a question about 49 Spy Pond Lane. If you could uh, use the reaction buttons, a raise hand function, 
or just turn your video on and you can just wave if you if you wanted to attract our attention. David, help me out with this. I don't see any none, anyone on our screen. And this is still, uh, if people feel like asking a question, I'm going to leave it open for people attending tonight while I ask my questions. I just wanted to know if that uh, measurement, who took the measurement, and if that's uh, accurate the, uh, between the, um, I'm going to say either the top of bank or the BVW at Spy Pond that says 67.9 feet. That's that's from the original site drawing. So, you know, everything that is in black here basically was was part of the okay. original drawing we had. Do you know the distance from the deck to the to spy pond? Um or would it be mi minus whatever whatever well, the deck know, the, is? The old, so pretty, pretty much minus design, what, what everything was about was more than fifty feet and I think it was typically, you know, sixty to eighty feet, depending on the angle of a pond. So yeah, I mean I think it's gonna be 60 to 70 feet at the closest. Yeah, so I would think it would just be simple math. I just just uh, subtract the width of the deck because that line probably goes to what I'm assuming would be the foundation, uh, yeah, the original so if foundation. That was true, it would be, if that goes to the foundation, that would be 59 feet. 59. Okay. Uh, my other question is just more of a uh, administrative question. I did look online and what was uploaded was a notice of intent and I did notice that it wasn't signed. So I would just like to make sure that we have a signed notice of intent before we issue an order of conditions. The hard copies That's... were all are all signed. Um, okay. Yeah. So David should have hard copies that are signed by me. I do. And the, um, Question that you had earlier, Chuck, about whether they've issued a DEP number for this is that no, they have not. So we'll need to continue this to the 19th. But I, you know, I, I don't know how you handle that in terms of voting. Mm. No, it could be up to up to the commission. But uh, okay. is it? I mean, we can leave it up to the commission. I would say that I would I would actually on this like to hear from the commission members about uh, issuing prior to a DEP file number. So, Chuck, can you educate me a little bit on what the DEP file number is? So you, you send in, uh, the same application that you sent to the Conservation Commission to the DEP, and, um, and that's in um, Woburn now. I think I have that right. And Woburn. And then you it's, also I think send it's your... Wilmington. I don't know. No, it's not. It's Wilmington. Okay. It's Woburn. Oh, okay. And um it used to be Wilmington. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> so uh and then you send a check to the lockbox in Boston. And once they receive the check and it clears, they issue a file number. But what the commission is waiting for and why we might hesitate about issuing is because sometimes they have comments. Um on certain projects, uh, you know, honestly, to me, I don't see this uh, having any comments from DEP because they don't recognize our aura. It's all buffer zone to them. And it's like you said, it's 59 feet away. So, um, but the commission has to decide on that themselves. So we usually don't issue until we hear from DEP, but accommodations could be made. Uh, so if you don't have any other questions, Kevin, I'm going to go back to the commission. I'm going to close public, uh, discussion and ask what people think about the D oh, I see Judith Russo just in time, Judith, why don't you unmute and talk, please. Yes. Judith Russo Stichter. I live on Garrison road. I'm in a butter to this property. I actually didn't have a question until your last statement. Um, I'm one of the people that fought so hard against having a house here at all, and I'm in favor of this build. I think Kevin has done an amazing job of being a steward of this property and has gone out of his way to comply with everything he's been asked to do. Before the commission starts talking about can they accommodate the fact that this one last step hasn't been taken, I don't know how Kevin feels about it, but another month in, and it's September, 
is kind of a burden, it would seem to me. So if there's any way you can do something contingent upon him getting a required approval from DEP so he doesn't have to come back in another month, um, mm. I would support that. Yeah, thanks, Judy. I would, I would agree for sure. Uh, hopefully that is just a technicality if it's going to be checked off anyways. Yes, sure. I appreciate your comments. Um, uh, I see that. So now I'm going to close off uh, public discussion and go back to the commission. Susan's hand was up first. Thanks, um, Chuck. I, I have two questions. One, you did submit this to DEP and you submitted a check. Is that correct? I'm addressing the applicant. Because if you didn't, that could be why. If you didn't understand the protocol. Uh, I sub there was three different checks and three different applications, and I'm pretty sure, yeah, one one was state and two were for the town. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. Just making sure because it is confusing sometimes. Um, the other question I had, and and maybe I just misread it, this um, plan that you have up lists for mitigation plantings two trees, which look like they're river birches, but I think in your narrative you said that they were eastern red something east well, that that's a common name for them they're eastern red cedars but it's a oh really? Cedar, really okay yeah they're Sorry. not cedar trees they're they're juniper okay. trees i yeah. i didn't know I, that i included, the, I included the latin names here just to clarify you know what okay. they are, but it's and it's in the application as well but they're all in the uh non-cultivar you know sounds great category. i have no other questions and i will just say for the record i'm okay with um kind of proceeding you know, dependent on getting a DEP number, but not have it, but not have being able to close the hearing. I would be okay with that. It's my opinion. I'm sure Nathaniel has it. Okay. Let's, <laughs> thanks, Susan. Uh, Nathaniel, please uh, take the floor. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Thanks. I'm. Uh, thanks, Kevin. I, I appreciate your your being responsive to the commission's concerns on this. I think this. Uh, this alternative, this project is uh, much more palatable, so I'm prepared to vote in favor of it. There are standard conditions. In terms of the procedure here, I think generally we, our practice is to keep the hearing open until the uh, file, DEP file number is issued. I think DEP is backed up, so it's a matter of us uh, emailing uh, Alicia or circuit rider to get the number or someone at staff, you know, someone at DEP just, just by reaching out because they are behind on these things, especially with, I think a lot of DEP folks were out on vacation the last two weeks of August. So that probably slowed things down as well. But perhaps what we might do is discuss and we could even take a, well, I guess we live with, with the hearing still open, take a vote or take a straw poll vote and David could would have enough to start preparing the application. So when we get the DEP file number next uh, in two weeks, not a month, someone mentioned a month, but it's actually only two weeks. We could then, um, if needed, address that or just vote to close the hearing then. So yeah, I do want to add one thing to that. Um, so as someone who looks at uh, the DEP website all the time, typically they will put name and address and all that, except the DEP file number. When I looked this afternoon, it had none of that almost as if it hadn't arrived yet. So they have no recollection of this application coming in to the Boston office or the Woburn office. So um, it's not just missing the DEP file number, it's missing the address, the name of the applicant, all, all that, which is kind of curious. And I'm glad Susan asked that question. It yeah, sounds like clarify. you had three checks. I yeah. I, I gave all of that to David Morgan, assuming he's supposed to mail it. But if I was supposed to, um, David, can you chime in? Yeah, that's what I was. I was starting to do that when we got on on the tangent. I, I mailed it in, so it is with DEP now and should be being okay. registered ASAP. Great. Yeah, it yeah I like just checked a minute ago, and I didn't see anything. I didn't see much up for for Arlington, surprisingly. So maybe the system's not working. Hmm. Okay. Uh... Uh, Mike Gildas can I see your hand this time. Yeah, I was just wondering uh, to clarify what has been said. Is it possible for us to approve uh, or close the hearing contingent upon uh, a positive response from DEP? So if we close the hearing and they have some uh, comments that needed to be addressed by the Conservation Commission, 
we'd have to open this up again uh, through one of the avenues, <laughs> you know, like uh, an amended order of conditions yeah, or something like mind. that. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it, it's a risk for sure, but I mean, I can, I feel like I could weigh the risk. I don't know. Nathaniel, can you go over your options again? I, I don't think you said close an issue. You said possibly close and wait to, and then prepare the um, order of conditions. Well, so my, yeah, my thought is to, to take a vote now, vote on it as if it's, as if, you know, deliberate and vote on it now with the hearing still open. I know we're supposed to close the hearing, but we could keep the hearing open just to get, to see if there's any comments from DEP. So close, vote, and then that's enough to give David Morgan to get him started on preparing the uh, order of conditions. And then on the 19th, we would know we could vote to close the hearing, assuming that there's no dramatic comment from DEP that needs to be addressed by the applicant. So, so we're doing a straw poll vote tonight and yeah. deliberating on special conditions so yeah. that David, David, David can Morgan prepare can prepare yeah. a draft order of conditions that would yeah. be ready for us on the 19th in two weeks to yeah. then close the hearing and just vote to approve it, assuming we have a straw poll to approve it tonight. Right. Is that what and you're then, saying? Okay. Yes. Yep, that is. Yep. And then David Morgan could issue it the next couple of days. He'd be a, right. Right he'd, away. He'd you have, wouldn't have to wait again. Yeah. Right. Yep. One question. Yeah. No, well, he could issue it, but they couldn't go for 10 days for the appeal period, which is mandatory. Right. Uh, why, why aren't you considering? So I'm not sure we need any more input. So if that's the case, why aren't we closing and then just issuing at the next meeting? Because we might and, the DEP in the off chance DEP has has the has a comment and it's our practice not to close. I tried to look okay. in the regs. It's not a reg requirement. It's just a sort of standard practice not to close in the hearing until we have the DEP file number and DEP comments. But so to, to not close because we may need some more input from the from the applicant is was that right? The yeah, reason? in response okay. to a, in a response okay. to a comment from DEP. Yeah, so Kevin, for your uh, edification, once you close, we cannot take any more public comment from the applicant or the public. And so if we were left with comments by DEP, we would be able to make uh, all the conditions up without any input from you or your contractor. So I think uh, and Nathaniel has a good uh, suggestion. We'll take a straw poll tonight and um, and then proceed with that so David Morgan can write the order of conditions. So with that, can I'll start with uh, Nathaniel Stevens. What is your, would you would like to make a straw poll motion? <laughs> is that how we're I'll gonna make do a, this? A straw. <laughs> I'll, I'll make a motion to approve the project contingent on you know, no comments, no negative comments from DEP. Can I get a second? Second. Mike killed this game. Susan Chapnick. Um, could I have a brief discussion? Sure. Very brief. Um, my brief discussion is approval with our standard conditions, including our vegetation conditions, because there's mitigation plantings. Yes. That Sorry have about that. Requirements yep. to be um, maintained in perpetuity, et cetera, et cetera. Kevin, I don't think this is anything you don't know because you have other mitigation plantings on your property already and you understand. The requirements of those, but I just needed to put that in the record. Sounds good. Okay. Thank you. Ben, Thanks. That was my discussion. Yeah. yeah. Sounds good. So uh, did you uh vote yes as and then amended? I vote yes. Yes. Okay, David White as amended. I'm Susan on this one. Great. David Kaplan. I would also vote yes. Uh Brian McBride. Yes as well. Mike Gildas game. Yes. Nathaniel Stevens. Yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. So it's unanimous. Okay. So that's all we do. We've already talked about the conditions and we'll come back on the 19th with DEP's comments and file numbers and um, close again an issue. So we need and, to vote. And we request that David Morgan draft an order of conditions. Yeah, to be, be ready. ready. To, to be, be ready, ready on the, the 19th. 19th when we meet. Okay. On the 19th. And then I'll need a motion to continue to the 19th. So moved. So moved. Second. Second. That was Mike, Mike Cap, uh, David Kaplan. Okay. So Nathaniel Stevens, David Kaplan, Mike Gildas game.
Yes. Susan Chapnick. Yes. David White. Yes. Brian McBride. Yes. Nathaniel Stevens. Yes. David Kaplan. Yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. Okay. We'll see you on the 19th and we'll have the paperwork with us. Thank you, Kevin. Can we clarify quickly though, Kevin, I don't think they need to come back unless there are comments. Yeah, I mean, how about if, uh, if, you know, if you find out if you get any negative comments, then I should come back and we should talk about it. But if they don't say anything, it's... That is a done deal. Yeah. 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 Okay. Absolutely. Okay. So, yeah, so David, keep, I'll just I'll coordinate with you and keep in touch. Yeah, with David. Appreciate okay. it. Great. Thanks, Thanks, everybody. All right, Kevin. Thank you, and Kevin. Thank I you. we really appreciate that you've been working with us and being a good steward of the land there. It's a, thank, thank you. you. I learned a lot, so it's been good. Yeah, I think this uh, when this came in, the commission was uh, confronted with the you know the abutters, and we took it seriously. And this is the result of taking that first application on building the house seriously. There was some conditions in that order of conditions that's going to affect this house moving forward. And uh, I think rightly so, but um, you're a great steward and you're a great guy and I appreciate your patience. So thank you. And we'll see you on the 19th. Or not. Or not. Yeah. Or not. Yeah, or not. <laughs> or not. Hopefully not. Yeah. See you in the neighborhood around the 18th. Yeah. Okay. Um, we have a uh, last thing on our agenda is a request for determination of applicability for uh, colonial village invasive vegetation management. This application, um, yeah, this application is going to be uh, reviewed and facilitated by our vice chair, Susan Chapnick. So Susan, could you take over with this? Sure, sure. So, um... This request for determination is, is uh, coming from Colonial Village and Parterre is the um, is the contractor who prepared the, this land management plan um, to uh, do invasive control around Mill Brook in a, a cult, a, an area of Mill Brook that's armored um, behind Colonial Village parking lot. Um, I don't know if you, several of you might remember almost a year ago now or last November, um, Chuck Taroni and I um, and David Morgan with Parterre did a site visit of this area um, to help inform um, this land management plan. And we recommended at that time they come back with an RDA um, to seek uh, approval for invasive control management. Um, I will I will say I am pleased that we had the glyphosate discussion first because this invasive control, though it does include manual and mechanical controls, also does include herbicides. So there will be some discussion about that. Um, and do we have somebody from Parterre? I see Miles. We have Miles. Connor. Connor. Very good. Miles, can you briefly go through the, the project for the commission? Uh, yeah, sure. Am I able to share screen? Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you for members of the commission. This is Miles Connors uh, representing Parterre Ecological, who would be the wrote this land management plan and would also be the contractors to complete the work. Um, so as uh, Susan and Chuck pointed out, it was uh, originally a um, notice of intent. We reapplied with an RDA. Um, this project is in, includes um, invasive plant management above, particularly above the um, armored wall adjacent to the public park. Um, Chuck or Susan, could you maybe give reference to the, the park name? I was just trying to look it up, actually. It's Herd. Herd. Herdfield. Herdfield. Mm -hmm. Herd mm -hmm. So it's literally adjacent to the herd field uh, chain link fence. Um, so on the other side of that chain link fence is a public walkway. Um, so there's um, a number of invasive plant species along the top of this wall. So this is the invasive plant management area uh, adjacent to the parking lot along Colonial Village. Here's herd um, ball field or park with a channel that runs through. The invasive plant inventory and species that we are uh, seeking approval for 
management include uh, Norway maple uh, saplings, primarily under uh, six inches in caliper, um, a great deal of Asiatic bittersweet, burning bush, Japanese knotweed, buckthorn, bit of loose strife, common buckthorn, black locust, and multi flower rose. So these are images taken uh, from the site. Um, this season, actually, we went out early. Um, it's gotten a little bit more aggressive than it was a year ago. Uh, and so you can see areas of the Japanese knotweed here. And this is actually behind, um, if any of you have been there, there's like a, a dumpster with some recycle bins. And this is that chain link fence that's um, at the at the edge of the uh, parking lot as well. So the invasive man management techniques include uh, first annual hand removal. That's typically of anything that's under about an inch in caliper, like something that you could, you know, wrap your hand around and pull out of the ground. Majority of the uh, material, because it's in adjacent to um, the top of this armored uh, cement wall and the chain link fence would be actually cut and dabbed so that the root system would remain um, in the ground and just kind of hold that, uh, hold that bank. We are looking to um, do cut and dab application would, of woody plant material would typically would be uh, primarily done with a uh, triclopyr based herbicide. And that's a, uh, like a garlon is the, is a trade name for that. And then specifically um, this is, and this is an example here showing like a cut and dab herbicide application. We have uh, a, Buckthorn blaster that we use. It's just like a handheld applicator. Specifically for the for the um, herbicide application, actually in this next image, it would be more appropriate for this time of year as the Japanese knotweed starts to come into flower. Um, and because it has not been cut earlier in the season, we would do a cut and fill application. This time of year, you can see this cut and tree. Uh, cut the stems between the first and third node and add a 50% solution of aquany, a glyphosate-based product, generally about five ounces per treated stem. Um, so this is the uh, medical grade bottle that we use for literally we just cut the plant just below the node and we fill up this portion of the plant with approximately five ounces of this 50% solution. Um, Highly effective this time of year, best time of year for treating Japanese knotweed as it comes into flower. Another observation about a cut and, um, and, and fill or a cut and treat is that this time of year as the plant does come into flower, it's loaded with bees. So the cut and fill is uh, safer than the other application this time of year. Just a graphic on bittersweet. Uh, this is more of a standard graphic, but we essentially will, you know, would cut it out of the trees, uh, but also all of it down to a stump along the top of that wall. And again, a cut and dabber side application of the bittersweet. Once the area has been cut, there are some areas that um, have a, a little bit of a, a steeper grade. I mean, it's essentially just like a, a smaller mound that uh, Chuck and Susan asked us to do a um, to seed and also to uh, use a jute uh, netting to solidify. So we'll either use a jute or like a with straw wattle associated for sediment erosion control. I should have mentioned also that the application will include uh, pig mats like underneath. It's like a it's a uh, herbicide um, absorbent mat will be used at the Underneath the application of the of the uh, Japanese army. so that's just as a second uh, tiered safety precaution along uh, adjacent waterways such as such as Mills Bay. After all areas have been cut and and soil has been exposed, the areas will be seeded. Uh, this is just an example of the uh, ball field next door. So quite literally, this is this is the pathway that's adjacent to Colonial Village. This picture was taken last year, um, and so the the, if the um, seed mix that we're looking to use, I think, is the same that was used along the edge of the ball field, which is a New England wetland plants conservation seed mix 
with these native uh, herbaceous grasses and wildflowers. Uh, we also have a timeline associated with this. I'm hoping that this is still fairly accurate. You know, not weed herbicide treatment, again, August into early September. We, we did not cut the not weed stand in early June, May or June. So we are actually just doing a treatment again. The cut and dab herbicide application would be throughout the season, um, as well as mechanical removal and hand removal and so forth. So we, in future seasons, I should point out too, this is not a one and done, particularly with the Japanese not weed and bittersweet in this in this particular project. We will we would like to go back next year um, and do ongoing like stewardship and management of invasives. The root system of bittersweet will undoubtedly re-sprout. So we would go back and do repeated cut and dab application next year with triclopyr based herbicide and the Japanese not weed would also um, be uh, cut in the May June time frame and then treated this time of year as well. So that's just a proposed management maintenance schedule written out. And then I have other information associated with with particular species, if you so desire to dig into it any further. Um, any questions about the scope of work? Yeah, I had just had one question. Uh, I wasn't quite sure of the overall time frame. So if you start uh, the treatments this year, for how many years do you for, uh, expect to be treating the knotweed and the other invasives? Uh, yeah, great question, Mike. I would say that we would be, it would probably about a three to five year time frame. After three years, all invasive plants, especially those that are woody, um, should be managed. We should also start to see fully stabilized soil of that seed mix that has started to come in. But I think the three to five years is more of the Japanese knotweed. We um, we typically see uh, in the first season about like 60 to 70% reduction in, in the population, the first treatment. The remaining 40 to 30% uh, is is the bugger. We have, um, you know, it comes back and it's often contorted. It comes up in these little bunches and bonsai uh, like form. And so, it, you know, it is weakened over time, but it is very, uh, you know, kind of dominant in as, the, as we continue to weaken the root systems. I suspect that in this particular location, because of the larger patch and the, and the location against that wall, that the root systems are fairly extensive uh, deep behind that wall, it and it would take probably three to five years to fully manage it out. Got it. Yeah, thanks. Are there any other questions from commissioners? I have a few, but I'll defer to the commission. Yeah, I... Chuck? Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had a couple of questions. I was just wondering with the... Um, so if you use glyphosate, that's great. It's... Uh, terrestrial area, and how would you protect over? I, I know you're not using overspray, but when you were telling us that you were cutting and um, then filling up that stem, it was about five ounces. Um, I had a concern that you may spill something, it may go mm -hmm. into the stream, and if any uh, precautions are needed. And then the second part of that question was if if you crush the skin, the stem in any way and it cracks, the glyphosate fill, uh, spills out is, can you just explain how that won't happen when you're cutting those stems? Mm -hmm. Sure, I mean, most of it is really just based upon a uh, pretty high volume of knotweed that we manage uh, every, every season um, on different residential, municipal, and even some institutional sites. I would say that we, and in a site like this, we'd probably all be done by hand. Again, the space is pretty narrow. Um, we would go through with um, Felcos and or mechanical means. But I, I, again, with the with the chain link fence, it'd probably just be hand tools. Uh, we would cut just below the node um, and, and essentially like work work along the top of the wall out and be moving those canes um, out, you know, away from over the stream and away from the uh, into into a truck for 
trash bags into for disposal. So, you know, if a if a stem is cracked, I mean, that's an observation that we need that we would notice. And then we would essentially just cut below the, um, you know, the following node underneath and make, make a fresh cut and then, and then apply at that time. Um, but, you know, the technicians that we have are, you know, they're trained, they're Massachusetts um, certified applicators, licensed applicators. And, you know, this is a, we do a lot of non-weed management. Is this area uh, going to be in seed while you're working on it? And if it was low flow conditions, would check dams be implemented on the stream somehow? I'm just, you know, seeds floating downstream. This is, a, you know, this is a very dense patch of um, knotweed. So I'm, I'm wondering how you're going to contain, you know, you have, you have a small corridor to work in. You have basically a retaining wall that goes into a stream. It's probably very slippery and all that, but how are you going to protect that stream and the material from getting into it and then collect anything that does get into it? The, the material being the herbicide? No, uh, the, like the the cut piece of knotweed. Oh yeah, so yeah, we would be uh, cutting, you know, cutting and and bagging, you know, at that at the actual location, passing the bags over the stream. The idea is is we would be building a like OSHA approved, um, let, like essentially land bridge from the uh, colonial village has, has said that we could remove a section of that chain link fence along the edge of the, their parking lot. And we would build a uh, platform to move across from one side to the other. And we would be uh, cutting, bagging, and moving the knotweed across that bridge into the back of the truck. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I have a few questions. One. Back in 2023, when we did the site visit, we also gave administrative approval, Dave Morgan did, for you to do any kind of hand pulling, any any kind of cutting. So that wasn't done? Is is that what I'm hearing? Uh, no, that was not done. Okay. Nope. Okay. No. Okay. And that was really, and that was more so just um, timelines and communications with, with, um, the colonial village and, and management, just it, the, the timing did not work out for that. Okay. Okay. Because yeah. I had I'd hoped that you would have been able to at least cut the knotweed when you wanted to. Um, right. So right. you're on yeah. a different timeline now. Okay. Yeah. So then I have a few, a few questions and concerns. Um, one is about the glyphosate being used because as we just learned, um, or maybe some of us knew, with or without surfactant, um, have severe differences in toxicity to aquatic organisms. And when I looked up the safety data sheets for Aquanet, mm -hmm. um, it first of all, it needs a surfactant, at least that's what it says. Um, and then it also says it's hazardous to aquatic environments. So I didn't know. So the surfactant, the surfactant will be required for a foliar application. Not for not for cut and dab. Correct. Not for cut and okay. So that's Correct. that's good. And yes. then and then were you aware that it says it's hazardous to aquatic environments? Um we yes, I was aware that it was, yes, it is hazardous to aquatic environments. Um it is my knowledge is is that it's less um it's it's less toxic than um roundup you know mm -hmm. so it, it falls like aquanid as well as rodeo and a few other like, glyphosate based products that have um an increased level of um half-life like in and being able to bind to soils um also, I would say, and this is, you know, kind of open for discussion, but the application type that we're doing here in terms of like cut and fill is, is a direct application to the stump of a plant in a fair and a very low volume. Um, so it's, it, you know, it, it, we're not doing foliar application. It's a cut and dab or a cut and fill, I should say, in this, in this particular instance directly to the plant. 
in a terrestrial like upland environment although very close and adjacent to right the, to the stream yeah it mm -hmm. is in a you know it is in uh, a very like kind of let's say what is it probably four at this time right now with the lack of rain probably a solid five feet <laughs> below on that wall so now what yeah there are there are other ones i've looked up because i just looked up safety data sheets in my sure. spare time aqua pro <laughs> what is that aqua pro a okay yeah. Yeah. i don't know the differences in efficacy but mm -hmm. aqua pro when i looked up the safety data sheet did not have a it did not have this warning about aquatic toxicity. Okay. So maybe All that's right. something you yeah. could look into. Um, sure, absolutely. Google, yeah. I just Googled them. So you could do the same thing. So that's A-Q-U-A-P-R-O. But it's good to yeah. hear that you would use it without a surfactant. Yes. So then then that's the, the cut and, and fill. Correct. Um, but you also have this foliar application that you're talking about. Are you talking about that for triclopyr, for glyphosate, for both? In what instances would you do a foliar application? That's a, a little more concerning that it would get away from you. Um, no, so there's not any foliar application that we're that we're talking about. We're, there's a cut and dab herbicide application. And okay. in following in following seasons, we have used a foaming, like this is a this is a uh, foam applicator. And there's a there is a glyphosate based product in the, with this foaming agent that diffuses out into a liquid or over the surf, surface of the leaf, and is you know taken in through the through the plant in a small um, application. I think in this particular instance, we're we're specifically be looking at a cut and cut and fill application. So there would be no foliar application. It would just be cut and fill as well as cut and dab herbicide okay. application on the on the woody plants and that would be the um you know the, the bittersweet buckthorn multiflora rose etc okay so the foam applications that you had in here on other years would would not be necessary i don't think it would be necessary no okay. it would be continuous as like a cut cut and okay. fill and if it that. was necessary you could come back for a minor amendment and ask us but i always feel more comfortable as the commission knows approving yeah. fewer herbicides and fewer application modes. Sure. For safety. Yep. Um, Absolutely. And we don't need them. So I'm glad we had that conversation. That's great. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm also questioning treating poison ivy. Okay. Um, so I know this is, you know, it's a controversial thing. I mean, if it was an area where people would walk through, um, you know, an area where you wanted to have some recreation or a path, I totally get it. But this area, you can't even get to it. There's a fence there. I mean, you can get to it, but most people can't get to it. So so do you think treating poison ivy is important in an area where humans can't get to it? Um, there so as I mentioned, the 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 public park and the walkway are literally, you know, oh, they're right there on the other side. On the other I side. Say, I see. Um, okay. so like in and I completely agree with you on on poison ivy as a native plant and a high source of, um, of, you know, habitat value. Has value, for yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in, in instances, we typically manage poison ivy like off the edge of, of public access. So that could be, you know, woodland trails. It could be, you know, public walkways such as the park that we're speaking about tonight. Um, so, and, and that's the why we brought it to that attention is because we do see it as a noxious, uh, toxic, um, you know, hazardous plant in this particular instance along the top of that wall as it comes through that chain link fence with potential exposure to folks walking on the um, on the walking path or, for that matter, retrieving a baseball. <laughs> okay, so so you would you would be okay with us maybe making a condition to treat it on the side of her field and otherwise. It's not necessary to eradicate it. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Um, sorry, just real quick, okay. Miles. Would do yeah. you have any concern for the safety of the um, of the workers while you're out there? Is there a, a you know something that is there a need to thin it out um, in case you come back in 
and you know in subsequent years to come back mm -hmm. to treat um would that make it easier for you and your crew mm -hmm. to navigate through less poison ivy um so i would just like to put that oh, out okay yeah yeah no i i <laughs> I appreciate that. It's uh, it is obviously you know uh, noxious to uh, our our team as well. Um, you know, and I will say based on you know Susan's comment on the condition that it's along the you know the edge of that you know public park. If we look back at the at the graphic here, I mean the majority of the of the line is is along that public park, right? So if that if that condition is met, you know mostly poison ivy. The only place that comes to my mind that, you know, where poison ivy populations would be is, you know, back in this woodland, you know, over in this area as the stream, as the stream comes through and makes that 90 degree hook. Um, so it might be in this more wooded area. But again, the invasives are, are less frequent in that area because there's more of an overstory. It's really as you come out into this more exposed, open, you know, top of wall environment that we're being and speaking of that, it just brings to mind too another condition that we talked about with uh, Chuck and um, Susan while we we're on site is behind this building here, I think, which is this. Um, there was a, there's a population of native sumac on this hill, and we do have in this land management plan a discussion of leaving that population of native sumac as a as a uh, as a native plant. So just back to the poison ivy, like if it's that condition, I would feel fairly confident that my team would be able to navigate, you know, a majority of this narrow space without, um, without you know, need of uh, fear of poison ivy. Thank, Thank you. you. I had a follow-up question. Is that sure. okay, Susan? Sure. Um, so Susan asked about um, the second year and the application, and it was a foaming application that you were going to apply to the leaves that uh, emerge. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, just so the commission knows, there's no surfactant in that um, application treatment either. There is no surfactant in that treatment. Okay. No. But I think we said we weren't going to approve that, Chuck. I mentioned that, and he, Mike said that. Yeah. Miles said that was okay. Oh, what what are you going to use the second year? If so you're the not second using... year would be would be like more of a cut, like a, a cut in the spring, and then a dab, and then a cut and dab in the late summer. I mean, if the if the if the commission would approve foaming to this foliar, I feel like we could manage it out uh, more quickly with most likely less herbicide. But if the commission would like us to not foam. And just use a cut and fill and a cut and dab. Um, we could also we could also do that. So you might want to explain that the second year the stems are a lot smaller. It's smaller. not yeah. as easy to. And I I'm used to that method that you said cut mm -hmm. and then return mm -hmm. and then cut again and dab. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I. I, I don't know why we didn't approve. What 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 was the reason why, Susie, you oh, didn't did it, like that I, foaming I just, one? It turns into a liquid. I was just concerned about drift. Yeah, Are so you, I think they're going to knock down. Course? Yeah, I think they're going to knock down all the uh, Japanese knotweed to a very low level, mostly on the ground. I mean, Correct. Miles, you you tell me and. Um, it, it, so it's not it's not up in the air. It won't be leaning. It'll be very much managed. It seems to me once a one years of treatment's gone by, it, it to most people it looks like it's been almost taken care of. But things mm -hmm. do grow, and they're going to have to come back and hit that. I just think it's going to be tough to um, drip into the smaller shoots uh, and mm -hmm. stems. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it is. So when they get smaller like that, we do get into more of like a cut, like a cut and dab. But you're absolutely right. If the herbicide, and you see here in this graphic, if the herbicide is able to translocate through the plant, that's when you have the most effective response to killing root mass. Is when the plant actually takes it through the leaf and it and it translocates like through the you know through the plant itself into the root system. By cutting and and just applying a very small amount of herbicide to the top of that stem, you would be um, 
you know, you would be treating it for probably for several seasons. And and again, to be honest, like I, the reason I'm being agreeable to this is we've been talking about it for a year and a half, and I'm simply trying to manage invasive plant species along the fence line adjacent to a public park on top of a, uh, you know, a, a stone wall, which I feel in many ways, like we've all probably also read literature, uh, you know, around the idea of what Japanese uh, Nawi roots can do for to uh, infrastructure. So I think it's in everyone's best interest to, to you know, ideally um, allow us to just, you know, manage a small of invasive plant species in this. Right. Copper as well. Thanks, Miles. Um, I see David and Nathaniel. I, I don't know who had their hand up first. Nathaniel. Okay, thank you, David. Thanks, David. Thanks, Susan. Miles, I'm just I'm looking at this picture with the foam application. Those those globs of foam, how long do they sit there? I'm just thinking if you put them on one day, do they and it rains that night, do they all wash off or you know what happens? Uh yeah, so as soon as that uh foaming agent hits the air, you know, it it begins to dis dissolve. It's almost like um, kind of like like soap or you know bubble bubbly soap. Like it's oh, okay. fused into into a liquid. So they don't. It doesn't harden. It, it it's not like a blob that will like blow away in the wind. It literally will sit on the leaf surface and immediately start moving into uh, a liquid a liquid form. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. David. Dave Kaplan, sorry. Yep, I just have a, a comment, you know, just based on what we heard from the presentation, um, you know, I'm, I'm a little less concerned about any drift from a foaming application that's directly applied to that leaf, um, you know, after sort of the understanding the fate and transport of this chemical and that it binds to the soil and that you know, if it were to drip, it would stay in place and it has a relatively low half-life. Um, I'd be, I think, and this would be allow less herbicide to be used in year two. Um, I just can't think of a more targeted way to get that herbicide to the plant and minimizing uh, its impact on non-target um, species. So I, I would be okay with allowing that application in year two. Thank you. Brian? Yeah, I have kind of a similar opinion. If, if it's a uh, approved uh, herbicide with an approved surfactant or foaming agent for this area and application, and you're trained uh, to Massachusetts standard, I'd support you doing, doing what you're describing. So I don't know any surfactant that's approved for aquatic environments, but maybe Miles does. Well, I don't think the surfactant is going to be used, I think. So that's think. correct. Okay. In, in, so it's not used general. even in the foam application. Okay. No. I, that was my question. He um, Miles said they're they're not using a surfactant. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank that's you. Correct. Yeah. I am still concerned about drift. Um, even with the with the information we got, um the the EPA study on the biological was concerned about drift and EPA was concerned about drift and put controls on it and then withdrew that um, due to lots of comments from um, the the pesticide makers, et cetera, as, as, and as our expert has said, EPA is, is restudying it and, and coming out in 2026. So I, I do mm -hmm. think drift is still an issue um that we should be concerned with but i i understand that maybe this application of foam doesn't lend itself to really drifting well yeah, yeah drift isn't, wait, wait. isn't drift from folio folio or spray application backpack sprayers right. drift right. yeah so I'm right not... spray and yeah right and yeah. but i was it's concerned about proposed. this like i guess i've never seen it done so the foam turns <sighs> into liquid the liquid doesn't drip drip off the leaves the liquid just absorbs right into the leaves it, yes correct yes okay. yeah yeah um so yeah i think what we have sorry david I, if you want to talk it's fine uh, so no, i think what we have is on the second year the 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 um vegetation is lower and and adding what david said david kaplan 
if it hits the ground, it's going to bind to the soil. So it's not hanging mm -hmm. over the water. So I think that study, and I was going to ask the same question as Nathaniel, that study sounded like it was for spraying. So there is a problem mm -hmm. with spraying. They, and again, when you're, um, when you're out there, they measure all these things that day. They refer to the label that day. It talks about wind direction. You know, it's an option. Mm -hmm. You know, if a windy day, they're not going to do things. Spraying. Mm -hmm. Now, we're not talking about cut and dab. I'm sure there's hardly any migration or drift with that. But that evaluation happens day of application. Mm -hmm. And Miles, you mentioned some kind of a, I'm just reading, a layer of plastic. Yes, yeah. Okay. So that's the pig mat that I was uh, briefly spoke of, and uh -huh. the pig mat is a it's a, essentially a, a PPE for er, for um, herbicide spill. Uh huh. So it comes, and and those would be and those would be placed down um, underneath the the application at the time of the application. It's a typical when we're doing when we're mm. doing foam or even even, you know, some of the cut and fill, you know, mm -hmm. it is, we put down a pig mat, which is, a, it's a, it's a trade name for, yeah. um, it, for like a, an absorbent mat. Okay. Exactly. Thank yeah. You. yeah. It's as Thank part you. of a spill kit. It's a spill kit, correct. Yeah. Okay. Correct. yeah. Got it. Dave Kaplan. Uh, yeah. Thank you. I would just like, maybe we could consider um, a condition and maybe maybe it's part of the label or maybe it's part of our standard conditions. I can't remember, but that the application will occur where there's no rain in the forecast for you know a certain amount of time for say 48 hours. Miles, do you have a sense of how long it takes for this chemical to translocate into the plant? Yeah, great question. And that is absolutely a standard practice for us. We do uh, look at weather. Uh, which sometimes just completely postpones days for us, even with like a chance of thunder showers or whatnot in the afternoon. Um, so yeah, I would say that the you know the herbicide is typically as soon as it you know dries uh, on the on the leaf surface, uh, you know according to the label, it's you know it's typically uh, you know safe. Um, but we we do not uh, apply during you know chances of rain typically within within 24 to 48 hours. So within 48 hours, that would be, you know, that would be fine. We, we, I would, that would, I mean, I think it's a great condition, quite honestly. Yeah. Thank you. So remember that this is an RDA. Now we do sometimes condition RDAs, but usually <laughs> like to keep them to a minimum. long, but that, mm -hmm. but that's a, that was a good suggestion. Mm -hmm. um, are there any other comments from commissioners? Seeing none, I will open up public comment. Um, are there any comments from the public on this um, RDA for invasive management of Mill around Millbrook and Colonial um, Village? Am I missing anybody? I'm I don't see anyone. Boxes. I don't see anyone. Okay, I will close public comment. I'll go back to the commission. Um, would any I'll, commissioners? I'll make a motion to close the hearing. Thank Second. you, Nathaniel. So that's Nathaniel and Chuck. Any further discussion? Okay, then I will take the roll call vote. And the roll call vote is Mike Gildeskane. Yes. David White. Yes. Uh, Brian McBride. Yes. Dave Kaplan. Yes. Chuck Taroni. Yes. Nathaniel Stevens. Yes. And the and the vice chair says yes. So we'll close the hearing. And can I um, consider a motion? But before we do that, should we consider a few conditions as we've discussed? Um, what I heard was that um, we are approving um, two types of herbicides, triclofir and, and glyphosate, we don't have to say that, but we said we would, surfactants would not be used on the glyphosate formulations. That was one condition. Another condition was on the application of herbicides 
would not be performed if a uh, rain event was expected within 48 hours. Um, uh, but it, what was the other? There was the application area would be lined with a pig mat or a, an absorbent mat. To okay. That's in, the, that's, in, that's in the that's in the that's proposal. in the materials. Yeah. So okay. I don't know if we need to add okay. it. Uh, I think there was a condition that the poison ivy would be treated on the side of herd field um, only. Um, that I don't know if we need to leave the population of native sumac because we're not talking about touching that at all. So maybe we'll. Do we need to put that as a condition or is that under? If it's not being proposed, it doesn't need to be. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. we could yeah. just leave that. The other one was we we asked the applicant to review the um, safety data sheets for the glyphosate formulations they're going to be using. Mm -hmm. Right? We're, we're trusting that they're going to choose one that's appropriate for the aquatic environment. With those, okay. with those conditions, I'll okay. oh, make a motion to issue a uh, positive that we have jurisdiction, but negative that uh, no notice of intent needs to be approved. Okay, I have a motion from Nathaniel. I'll second that. That was Dave Kaplan. Okay, um, any further discussion? Okay, I will take a roll call vote. Mike Gildesgang. Yes. Chuck Taroni. Yes. David White. Yes. Um, Brian McBride. Yes. Dave Kaplan. Yes. Nathaniel Stevens. Yes. And I say yes. So we have, um, you will get your your um, determination and with, a, with those conditions as we've discussed, Miles, and hopefully you can get going for them this fall. It's only been a year. <laughs> yeah, is there a 10-day uh, uh, period with an RDA? Not if it's a negative. No, okay. it's a negative yeah. determination. So you could get going. I mean, you, you okay. basically know the determinations, but yeah. um, you could, you know, Dave, David Morgan will get that out to you. David, okay. are, you, are you all set with the conditions? Just realizes that your risk. I think they needed to say that too. Proceeding um, at your own risk, Miles, right. if you're going to yeah. proceed without before the 10-day appeal period's over. No, the, okay. There's no 10-day appeal period. Because yes, there is. no, oh, there, there still is. Oh, okay, that's right. Uh, okay. You can appeal it, the them. option is that they could appeal. They could, can, they could work at their own risk. That's their option. Okay, got it. So, how do you evaluate that? Who came? You know, right. what's the likelihood <laughs> of DEP saying? You know, that's all that. And there was no public comment. So, but that's your. But uh, David Morgan, are you are you all set with the conditions, or you can pass them by us? Um, I, okay. am, no, I, was, I was taking notes on the conditions. So okay, great. Simple, I'll be able to get those issued. Right in there. Great. Wonderful. Okay. Our, well, thanks, Miles, uh, and thanks for working with us on this. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, okay. thank you. Appreciate thank you all, it. members of the commission. Thank you so all much. Right, Miles. Thank you. All right, have, have a good night. night. All right, Susan, I'll uh, yep, close, close it out. Back. Close back it out. Back. Okay. So here we are, just a minute, couple of minutes before 10. I just want to remind the commission to use the doodle poll about, uh, what was it? Um, Town Day. Town Day. September 21st, oh. 2024. That's Town Day. And with that and no more comments, I would like everyone to, I'd like a motion to adjourn and then we'll just voice it with our hands and just say yay. Move to adjourn. Second. 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 Yeah. Okay. Yay. Bye, everybody. everybody. Good night, everyone. Bye. Unanimous. Take care. Yep. Bye. ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help.